the session to order. Can we get a roll call? Commissioner Beeman. Present. Commissioner Hodge. Here. Commissioner Labar. Commissioner Light. Here. Commissioner Macieski. Here. Commissioner Robbie. Commissioner Sanders. Present. Commissioner Scott and Commissioner Somerville. Here. All righty, moving on. Um, we are now going to enter into our public participation part of working session. Um, at this point, we will allow one minute for residents to address the board. If you stick around for our regular meeting, you'll get three full minutes. So if anybody in the audience would like to address the board, you may do so now. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Matt McDonnell. I'm the managing director of the Washington County Road Commission. I just wanted to come down and uh, so you could put a, a face to a name and follow up on my uh, invitation to meet with y'all. If you have any questions or concerns, I'd be happy to meet with you. And uh, I look forward to attending uh, the meeting next month to talk about the Renew and Restore Half Mill uh, County Road Millage and non rise. So I uh, just wanted to say hello and uh, wish you all this evening. So look forward to the conversation next month. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wishing to speak? Do we have anyone online? No? Okay. Moving on. Um, do we have a report from the county administrator? Just one thing. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I wanted to make sure that I thanked all of you for your encouragement and counsel over the weekend. As you know, we had a very, very difficult uh, uh, series of events this weekend, and I feel good about our response, but wanted to say thank you to you all uh, for your counsel as we move through uh, making certain that all of our residents were cared for over the weekend. That concludes my report. Thank you, Administrator Dill. And do we have a report from the Board of Commissioners liaison? No report, Chair. Okay, thank you. Moving on, we're gonna to go to the first discussion under discussion items. We have an ARPA update from Elise Payne, our racial equity officer. Good morning, or good afternoon, commissioners. You start off by getting laughed at. It only goes, it only goes up from there, right? Uh, can you pull up the, wonderful, thank you. So I'm here to provide an update on the uh, Washtenaw Rescue Plan this evening. Um, I, can, I can jump to the end and say the short version is by the end of this year, all funds um, that we set out to obligate um, or encumber, um, we will have done that. Um, so many municipalities are currently struggling to appropriately program their funds. Uh, I'm proud to say that that is not the case here in Washtenaw County, which means that we've done exactly what we set out to do with this funding um, and get it out to the most needed areas of our community. For the public who may not be quite as familiar, uh, the ARPA funding, American Rescue Plan funding, um, was just over $1.9 trillion of emergency funding allocated by the Biden administration in 2021 to address the ongoing issues of the COVID pandemic. Um, this funding went out to support local, state, tribal governments um, to address issues related to the pandemic and disparities that we were seeing in terms of um, health outcomes, but also secondary impacts. Washtenaw County received just over $71 million in um, COVID relief funding. Again, for those who may not be familiar, uh, U.S. Treasury issued um, three very specific areas of focus for use. So prioritization of racial and economic equity and use of funds, um, prioritization for populations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So those would be senior populations, um, populations that were in hot zones of infection, um, and populations at risk of disproportionate impact for COVID-19 due to pre-existing disparities. So um, communities that had already been dealing with issues of generational poverty, um, communities that were already dealing with issues of digi digital divide or learning loss, um, and communities that were dealing with issues of health disparity. 
So I'm going to walk us through um, the county's ARPA allocation um, starting in 2001 um, and talk about where we invested funding and where we are currently at um, in, in use of those funds. Um, so in ARPA 1.0, uh, investing in child care access, there was a $2 million combined general fund and ARPA investment. Um, that project is fully underway um, and just about 92% spent down from the initial allocation. Um, we are expecting to have funds fully expended um, by the end of this year um, and not expecting to have any additional funding available for reprogramming. Childhood savings accounts, which I know is a passion project of at least one of our commissioners, uh, was a $6.7 million combined investment of general fund um, and ARPA allocation. Um, the project status were fully underway. Uh, more than 12,000 student accounts have been opened and funded. Uh, we are expecting to have the project fully complete by the end of this year um, and not expecting to have any additional funding available for reprogramming. Broadband, uh, another large ticket item in terms of capital investment for um, this board. Uh, just under $15 million combined general fund and ARPA investment. Uh, projects, again, fully underway. All contracts have been issued and we are in active construction. Uh, expected project completion is a little bit further out because this is an infrastructure project and eligible period of use is through the end of 2026. Um, that is a conservative estimate. We're, we're more likely going to see project completion uh, by the end of 2025, but end of 2026 is, is the eligible period of use. We're not expecting to have any additional funding in that area for reprogramming. Broadband affordability, literacy, and access um, is part of ARPA 1.0. We're in exploratory phase with Ypsilanti District Library, Whitmore Lake Library, um, and Sycamore Meadows for a public Wi-Fi project, looking at areas that um, did not necessarily have issues with hardware in the same way as some of our more rural and Western communities, um, but do have issues with affordability and access and looking at ways to um, create strategic investment that will not incur ongoing programmatic costs. Um, for the programmatic funding, which would be Ypsilanti District Library, Whitmore Lake Library, we're looking at um, the end of 2024 for completion of programmatic funding. For the infrastructure projects, uh, Sycamore Meadows, uh, we're looking at the end of 2026. Now, I do wanna be clear that the Sycamore Meadows project is more aspirational um, and in its very early phases. So that funding may end up going um, all to our library partners, but we're looking at how we can stand up a public Wi-Fi option in that area, given that Sycamore Meadows was an area of, and continues to be an area of deep disparity that we know um, was hard hit by the pandemic, continues to suffer learning loss and affordability is a significant issue for broadband access. Expanding weatherization services in Washtenaw County, this was a $1.4 million investment. Uh, project status is fully underway. This goes to um, supporting winterization of homes, um, to making critical repairs, oftentimes for um, seniors, low-income households that are at very high risk um, if they don't have those repairs made. Um, we're not expecting to see any additional funding available for reprogramming in that area. Uh, building a strong equity-driven health department. This was the first round allocation for the health department. Um, this was a $2.5 million, two, just under $2.6 million investment, um, specifically of ARPA funding. There was additional general fund um, that was invested in this area as well that has been fully spent down. Um, this product, project is fully underway. There were some initial challenges, uh, areas that we were given guidance by Treasury that would be eligible for expenditure turned out to not be eligible based upon the uh, updated guidance that we received from Treasury. For those who are not tracking Treasury's information uh, the way that the internal county team is, we received updated guidance from Treasury about every six weeks. So it's been a it's been an interesting uh, process with them. Um, funding was reprogrammed within eligible uses already identified in ARPA 2.0. Uh, and the, we're expecting to have uh, project funds fully expended by the end of 2024. Mobile su services support initiative. Um, this I know, Commissioner Sanders is, is your champion project. 
Um, we have secured uh, the vehicle, as uh, many of you were able to see at our board meeting in December. Um, this project is fully underway. Again, uh, programmatic funding and so expected completion um, by the end of 2024, not expecting to have any program funding uh, remaining available. And this was just under um, $730,000 in investment. Community priority fund. Um, this was a $8 million investment, 7.2 million went directly to um, grants and disbursements for community organizations and groups. Um, the remaining funding was uh, earmarked for um, data monitoring support services. Um, this project is also fully underway. Um, and again, project completion scheduled for 2024 with no expected funding available for reprogramming. Premium pay to essential workers. This is different than workforce stabilization. Um, this investment was a 3.27 investment in um, work uh, premium pay to essential workers. So this helps support um, those who are very specifically in frontline positions. This project, uh, this funding has been fully executed um, and projects completed uh, with no additional funds available for reprogramming. Bless you. Support for seniors, this is a $4 million investment. Um, again, fully underway, RFP was issued, contracts have been fully issued. Um, we are uh, in active work in the organizations that have received funding, have all um, completed the contracting process. We're expecting a uh, project's completion of uh, end of this year, so end of 2024, with no additional funding available for reprogramming. Affordable home ownership development. This is uh, commonly known as the 220 North Park project. Um, this was a $3.6 million investment in um, affordable home ownership opportunity. Um, this is also known as the Dorsey Estate Project in Ypsilanti. Um, this project is fully underway. They are in construction and expected to um, move into um, initial sales in uh, June of this year, um, which will mean that the construction funds have been fully expended. Uh, with no additional funding available. Stormwater infrastructure. Uh, this is a $2 million investment that has gone um, primarily out via a grant system with, uh, in partnership with the Water Resources uh, Commission or Water Resources Commissioner. Um, this is fully underway projected projects completion of this year um, with no additional funding available for reprogramming. Small business equity funds. This was initially um, under the Financial Equity Center. Um, this funding was fully reprogrammed to support workforce stabilization payments and housing support allocation. Primarily, it went to the housing support allocation. Um, projected projects completion. Um, the funding was fully reprogrammed as of November of last year, and there is no available funding left for reprogramming. Financial Empowerment Center, this is a $1.2 million investment to stand up our financial empowerment centers. Um, this is in part partnership, happening in partnership with um, EMU and other community partners. This project is fully underway with a projected project completion of end of this year. I should say that this specific model, um, the funding that was tasked through ARPA is only eligible for use until the end of this year. I know there is interest in continuing um, the Financial Empowerment Center model. Uh, at this point, um, it's undetermined if they will be able to fully move through their ARPA allocation, um, given the speed at which they have moved through the, um, the current resources. Um, we will reassess at the conclusion of quarter one um, and plan on bringing something back to the board. Financial services for unbanked, and underbanked residents, this was um, an investment of just under $200,000. Project status um, funding is, was fully reprogrammed for the housing support allocation uh, and fully reprogrammed as of November of 2023. There's no additional funding available for re reprogramming in this category. The Fine and Fee Justice Reform Project, um, this was a $500,000 investment. Um, funding was partially reprogrammed and the remainder is fully underway. So partial reprogramming for the housing support investment um, and the two other projects, uh, Public Defenders Jail Therapy Program 
and the Children's Services Earn and Learn program are both fully underway uh, with a projected project completion of 12-24. There is no additional funding available in this category for reprogramming. Down payment assistance, um, this is a million dollar investment. Um, this is pending completion of the Dorsey Estate affordable units. Um, just under $5,000 was reprogrammed for housing support. The remaining balance is being held for the Dor Dorsey Estate project. It was always designed um, to help ensure affordability um, for those units. One of the issues that comes up frequently in down payment assistance programs is that they are often structured as a secondary loan, meaning a person may be eligible for down payment assistance, but they effectively have um, enormous debt and are not generally able to secure equity in a property um, in any kind of reasonable time frame. And because this is designed as a affordable housing unit, a affordable housing home ownership opportunity to also help build generational wealth, creation of equity is an important component of the overall model. There is no uh, projected funding available for reprogramming in this category. This is the second uh, allocation of health department funding. This was a $4 million investment. Um, Partial funding was reprogrammed for workforce stabilization support. Um, the remainder of funding is fully underway with projected project completion uh, at the end of 2024. Uh, projected funding available for reprogramming at this time is, is none. County infrastructure, uh, this is a $4 million investment. These projects are fully underway. Infrastructure projects, again, as a reminder, are eligible for expenditure through um, 2026. Uh, we're not expecting any additional funding to be available for reprogramming in this category. Government services, again, project status fully underway for a $4 million investment in this category as well uh, with projected project completion at the end of 2024. Um, not expecting to have any additional funding available for reprogramming in this area. The ARPA support position, this was a $700,000 investment. Um, it was reprogrammed um, as part of some of the shift in the data evaluation and monitoring of the um, ARPA projects, or all ARPA projects, not just the CPF work. Um, this is falls into the category of administration of ARPA funds. It is an eligible category of expenditure uh, through the end of 2026. We're not expecting any programming, any dollars to be available for reprogramming in this area as well. Um, and evaluation is, is fully underway. I know many of you commissioners have heard from the evaluation team um, to start the process of scheduling your initial interviews as, as part of that, that uh, ongoing evaluation process. Eastside Recreation Center, that's a $7 million investment. Um, project status, active negotiation underway for site acquisition. Um, anyone who's engaged in construction projects knows that this level of funding will go very quickly once you have a purchase agreement signed. Um, again, expected project completion date is currently listed as through 2026. That's an eligible period of use. We expect the funding to be fully expended um, by the end of quarter three this year, provided the purchase agreement is signed um, in a timely fashion. We're not expecting any um, funding to be available for reprogramming in this area as well. So potential funding for reprogramming, um, looking at the category of the Financial Empowerment Center and potentially the um, broadband access. At this time, at the end of, um, as of January of 2024, we're looking at less than $500,000 potential for reprogramming. Now, more than likely that number will go down um, by the time we get through um, quarter two. The idea is that we're being very conservative to ensure that there are no funds that are, are, are left available uh, for reprogramming because the goal is to make sure that um, as of the end of the eligibility period, we've spent every dollar down to the last penny um, and that the resources have gone out to community to ensure um, that the people who needed them were able to receive the support and services from the county. Couple key points and deadlines that I want to raise for this group. So, all programmatic funding um, has to be fully expended by the end of 2024. Um, and that includes staff positions that are supporting programmatic areas. Um, 
outside of administration of ARPA funding, um, if we have uh, projects within the health department or um, OCD or um, thinking that those are the areas in which they're, they're uh, we currently have staff positions that are being that are directly supporting programmatic areas. Those positions are not eligible for continued funding um, under ARPA past December of 2024. Infrastructure contracts must be fully executed. That means signed all the way through the process um, by the end of 2024 and infrastructure projects uh, must be fully expended by the end of 2026. So we have a little bit more time with infrastructure projects, um, but we have to have contracts fully executed by the 1224 date for eligible use. Uh, ARPA administration evaluation, reporting, monitoring, um, and compliance funding um, must be expended by the end of 2026 because we'll have ongoing data monitoring, reporting, compliance activities that are required. Some areas of potential concern. Um, programmatic investment comprises the bulk of expenditures. And so areas that have seen um, increased funding for programs, there is no identified funding source past the end of um, December 2024 to support those specific programs. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we tried to be very intentional about was prevention of creation of long-term structural liabilities with funding that we knew was time limited. Um, that still has happened to a certain extent in particular areas. And so it's important to be aware that um, there is no additional funding identified to support those programmatic areas past December of this year. Uh, and again, ARPA funded programs, including staffing are not eligible expenditures past 12, 2024. Uh, I am pleased to report that on the monitoring, reporting, and evaluation uh, side of things, we have been on top of and um, in complete compliance with all of the required reporting. Um, quarterly and annual have been su submitted complete and on time, um, and we're currently engaged in a 360 evaluation of all ARPA investments, including the process in which the board undertook and the county has undertook um, to disperse funds out to the community, um, and that process is fully underway. Um, I want to take a moment to say thank you to the finance team. Uh, the ARPA funding is the most complex funding that the county has ever been asked to absorb, um, and despite uh, all of the benefit it is very complicated to effectively move this money out the door. And so I, I want to thank our CFO and the entire uh, finance team for all of their hard work um, because it has been a bear. So in terms of next steps, um, ongoing monitoring of projected funding spend down rates and report to board of commissioners at the end of quarter two, status of spend down projections and reallocation as needed. Um, that will provide the appropriate time period and runway so that the board has the ability to reprogram any funding that may be available. But again, what we're looking at this at this particular time is under $500,000 uh, $500, in, in remaining funding. Happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, great presentation and thank you for all of your work. Um, and thank you to the finance team also. I know that it has been um, crazy that it's been four years since all this started. So, um, okay, first in the queue, Commissioner Robbie, then ha Chair Hodge and Commissioner Hodge right now. Uh, sorry, Chair, yeah, and then Sanders and then Scott, go for it. It's a good order, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Elise, for the presentation. Really appreciate your time with this. Um, in the interest of time, since I know we have another presentation, uh, I have a few asks for information uh, that hopefully you can share with the whole board um, and myself. I would prefer a, another presentation rather than an email personally. But um, the first thing I was hoping for, you know, so th this is all great and I appreciate the overview um, for my part, you know, I wasn't here in 21 or 22, so I don't know detail on a lot of these programs, and I'd love to get a better sense of understanding of, you know, what we actually funded with this. Um, and I think in terms of sort of an executive summary of that, what, what I would like to see is uh, the breakdown, you know, the total amount of money spent through this, and then sort of a breakdown of 
what what was spent in terms of like in-house versus out of house uh, at the county. I'll wait till you get a pen. It's very important. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so like so a breakdown of you know what we what we spent on in-house programs and investments versus money that sort of like went out to community organizations or other organizations. I would just like to see like total dollar figures and then within each of these headings that you have, you know, what sort of what amount was spent at the county versus outside of the county. Mm -hmm. Um and then uh in terms of the your your last couple slides, that was you know, obviously this it's extremely concerning. And the first thought that I had and what I whispered to uh, Commissioner Scott is I feel like our national economy is going to tank on January 1st, 2025, because all these people are going to be losing jobs, basically, potentially around our country. It's not just us that have to spend it by 2024. And so I'm concerned about the staff, the, the, the structural programming that we've invested in using this money and how uh, that will look for our county. And so I, I really feel like we need to develop and approve as a board a plan with your you know, recommendation and the recommendation of staff of how we're going to, like, what does the drawdown look like? What does the spend down look like? Or not spend down, but the, the you know, drawdown of having this money versus what things look like in January 2025 with an eye to how do we make sure that like talented staff that we have at the county aren't just like, terminated because their positions ended because the federal money went away. The advantage that we have right now is that we have some time. Yeah. We have an entire year. And so how do we create that runway so that, you know, if there is somebody that retires, we can fill that position with somebody on a more permanent basis that's doing good work at the county in a temporarily funded position. So I'd like for us to have a detailed plan of how that looks. Um, and, you know, for staff purposes and programmatically, I think we're going to have to have a conversation of what is going to, I mean, basically you said no plans for future funding on any of these because we don't have the money, but what is it in here that is a programmatic investment that we feel is important to continue on? And I think that's a discussion we need to have kind of as a board to figure out. That's not something necessarily that you can answer, but um, I think that should be incorporated in, in that analysis or that plan of how we look at, um, you know, uh, a post- um, ARPA future in January of 2025 for programs and January of 2027 for uh, infrastructure investments. I do have some specific questions on some of the slides, but I've been talking a lot. Annie's looking at me. I know we have limited time, uh, which is always a complaint of mine for working session, but uh, I will stop talking and uh, ask my other questions later. Huh? I wasn't trying to rush you. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'll go. I will stop now and go on around two uh, with my other questions. Thank you. It was very gracious of you, Commissioner Robbie, to you know be thoughtful with the time. Uh, we're we're doing it different in 2024. It's it's, it's a good year so far. Uh, at least you don't need the pin for my remarks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, you know it's a large sum of money, and I wanted you to to speak a bit about how it was administered, like who was responsible for doing that and overseeing so many of the really large projects that were here. Can you talk about that? So coordination uh, and oversight of uh, compliance reporting, monitoring is coming through my office. Um, in terms of distribution of funds and administration of specific programmatic areas, health department is responsible for their areas, broadband. We have a project manager that we're working with um, who's managing our contracts with external vendors. Um, the community priority fund is directly managed by my office um, and that has been just about 30 organizations, um, mostly new to the to the county who've received some direct funding and technical assistance. Um, the mobile support services initiative um, is being operationalized by my office. I think I wanna really highlight that it's been a team effort. The complexity of this funding requires that we are working in conjunction with each other. Um, for funding that has gone out to community partners, um, what we're doing is providing the appropriate compliance checks in that process, um, but depending on how the funding is structured, whether it is RFP or something or a less traditional model, um, that's determined how we, we're working with those organizations. 
All right, I appreciate that. You were very gracious in the presentation to you know uplift the work that many other people did. Um, so I just also wanted to give you an opportunity to you know make it really clear how much work you and your team did as well. I think you frequently say something like you have like one or two staff people in an office plant. Uh, so it's a, a heavy lift for a few people on many of those projects. So I just wanted to thank you publicly for your work on it. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, I, uh, we're a small but mighty team, but all of the administration team is very lean and we do a lot with very few people and manage many of the complexities of um, overall operations for the county. And the office plant has survived. Just want to get that. We up. are on our fourth office plant. We are on the fourth office plant. Okay. Four years. Four years. I mean, it's, you know, she could answer right. my question. That was good. Thank you. I'm done. Commissioner Sanders and then Scott. <laughs> Very punny. <laughs> uh, I had a question about why uh, Sycamore um, related to um, connectivity support is aspirational when the other two were not listed as such. It's the first question. And the second one is related to the unbanked. I, I wanted to get a picture of how that funding was utilized. How were people able to access it? Sure. What was it was supposed to be? What were we giving it to them to do? I know what unbanked means, but for the sake of everybody else. Uh, so I'll answer your first question. Uh, Sycamore Meadows, I, I look at it as more aspirational um, because it's an infrastructure project. It's actually setting up enterprise solution for public Wi-Fi in the area. That's always more complicated than um, use of programmatic funding, um, just in terms of like actually building the infrastructure that's required to set something like that up. Um, so I, I identify it as aspirational, but I, I actually had an opportunity um, to speak with um, our director of IT, Jeff Rose, right before this meeting started. Um, and so I'm very hopeful about that moving forward, but want to be transparent about the status of the project. Um, in terms of the unbanked and underbanked, um, that funding was initially designed to help support um, households that maybe are not in our traditional banking system because they are subject to, they're often dealing with um, poverty, um, subject to um, predatory financial systems, payday loans, that kind of thing. Um, and having access or lack of access to a bank account um, is one of the key factors where people are either able to move out of poverty and, and into stabilization or not. Um, so the funding was initially designed to help that population move from an unbanked status to a bank status. Um, and we can go into details about like what that was initially going to look like. That funding was reprogrammed to support the housing and homelessness initiative that the board passed last year. So when you say reprogrammed, we took it. Yes. It became unavailable for yes. what it was initial, initially planned. Yes, that is correct. So does that mean no one benefited from this initially planned funding for unbanked and underbanked? Uh, it means the board made the determination that the priority area for that funding was the um, housing and homelessness impacts allocation. Um, okay, so later, I'd like to know how many of those uh, restructures occurred. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, Elise, thank you very much. Uh, a great presentation. I think a, a nice, uh, succinct overview of some of the enormously fantastic work that we've done. I want to um, note just uh, for a moment, even though there was one particular champion about the um, uh, savings accounts for kids, thank you, Commissioner Hodge, um, I, <laughs> I was very excited to support that too. And just to note for my colleagues and anybody listening to the meeting, um, two weeks ago, I was listening to NPR and they were talking about, um, I believe, Cleveland, who did this um, with some of their money and how fantastic and revolutionary it was. And I was just screaming at my radio um, that we did it first. 
Um, and that was uh, great for them and that we should have gotten that national story, not them. Um, so good job, whoever it was, I think Cleveland, but we were there first. Um, so I'm very proud of that work that we've done and would love to see a way we can continue to do that. My question for you is, um, I, I guess I missed, there was one, oh, it was, oh, the Financial Empowerment Center. I think you said um, uh, kind of the, the, how did you say it? The programmatic dollars might not be spent because of the, like it was a lot of money. When, when is that money then, if it doesn't get spent, I feel like I have clarity at the end of the presentation that money comes back to us but then what can we do with it after that? Or is it just gone? So that's a great question. Um, I, I should note that the board unanimously passed support for the childhood savings accounts. I just- yeah. it, We all did, yes, we did. Chair, yeah. Chair Hodge was just the person I spoke to most recently about it. Yeah. Um, but it was, a, it was a unanimous board decision. It was, it was. Um, in terms of reprogramming of funding, so, we will know um, at the roughly around the end of quarter two um, if the Financial Empowerment Center realistically is going to be able to move through um, the funding that has been allocated to them. They started a little bit slower than was initially expecting. However, I know that they have ramped up services, so I want to be intentional about how I'm, I'm framing where they're currently at. Um, if there is going to be funding available for reprogramming, that would be information that comes back to the board. The board makes a determination about how those funds are reprogrammed. If you're interested in using them for um, anything that falls under a programmatic category, they would have to be out the door um, by the end of this year, so end of 2024. Um, if you, there's interest in reprogramming, reprogramming them for an infrastructure project of some sort, um, we would have to have a contract executed fully by the end of this year, but would have through 2026 to spend those dollars. That's um, great and alarming. Um, it, I think we'll probably need to start thinking about things like that as a board now, just about what we might do. And I, I guess I'm wondering, there's probably other, I have thought about this. These are things that wake me up at night on the 1,970 thing that wake me up at night, this is one of them. And so I guess I would wanna be clear with all of that ARPA money. I don't wanna, I, I would be so unhappy if some of it just went, disappeared like poof, because we either weren't told by people who were getting that money or, or we weren't paying attention. Um, because I think even though we have to move fast, I think the appetite of this board to make sure that we spend every, last cent of that money to help make our community is is there so I think that has been clearly identified as a board priority and an administration and the team that's working on this have deep understanding that the um the mandate is that we get every dollar every penny out of the door we're not sending money back no money is going to to go poof um, it will be used appropriately and at the direction of the, the board and, and the board priorities. Okay, great. Thank you. And just for some additional context, what we're looking at right now in terms of reprogramming is about $500,000, maybe a little bit less. So we're, we're not talking about figuring out how to spend several million dollars. I feel like this board could get through $500,000 in a meeting. Yeah. All right, Commissioner Machieski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at least thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would be curious to know uh, in building upon the other pieces of information that have been requested this evening, uh, how, how much of the ARPA allocation has been allocated to new programs um, uh, that are obviously you don't have any funding sources going forward. So I'm, I'm curious to know the, the number of programs, how much money, what the percentages of the overall ARPA pot were, were for new programs that were created that have no identified source for continuing. So that was that's just a question I wanted to put out there. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, anyone else before we go back around again? Um, the one, I, I had a few that I'll just add to the queue for later. Um, I guess I just had questions on like the the down payment assistance and because obviously there's spend down time, I guess. Um, 
because I live, I live so close to that development. Um, I guess my initial reaction was, okay, like what does the timeline look like on actually um, getting the dollars to people for down payment assistance? Like, oh, sorry, down payment assistance, and what does that actually look like with the money moving? Um, and then with respect to like, I actually wrote the notes down for both the infrastructure and the government services slide. Which one of those areas is the area that we're going to be able to pull funds from to redo our website? And it, I, that was part of conversations a while ago. And I'm just wondering if that's still happening um, because I would be a big fan of improving our website. Um, and then the unbunked and underbunked. Um, unbanked and sorry, unbanked. Un, unbanked and underbunked. Sorry. Um, I'm, I write half like regular and half cursive. That's my writing style. So sometimes I get confused. Um, so we approved some money in the, the housing funds for that, but you're saying, were you saying that the initial allocation didn't get spent? So the initial allocation was designed to move in partnership with the um, Financial Empowerment Center. Um, the Financial Empowerment Center getting their structure up, moving a little bit more slowly. Um, we were expecting to have some additional time and then the housing allocation needed to move forward and the board reprogram those funds. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Rabi. Thank you. Um, if these aren't questions that can be answered right now, we can do them later, but a few, a few more specifically, I do want more detail basically on every one of these slides, but the ones that I'm the most interested in knowing more about is um, the broadband infrastructure one. I, I particularly want to understand uh, the nature of the ongoing structure of how those investments um, will exist. So in my mind, it's trying to understand like, did we did we build the infrastructure? Do we own the infrastructure? Did we give the money to Comcast to build the infrastructure? If we gave the money to Comcast to build the infrastructure, what what are the rates that they're charging residents as a result of the investment that we've made? I just want to understand what the what the contract look like basically to effectuate those projects. So if you want to give me a quick overview or if you want to tell me later. I think that is a larger question and I see okay. Administrator Dill signaling. So, <laughs> so what, what I'll say to the commissioners is that we gave a, an overview of the broadband project last week. I forget the day, I think it was Thursday. And um, I think it was very well received. And at that time I talked to Chris Scherer, our, our program uh, administrator about providing an update to the board. So that is coming to a future working session and we'll work to get you guys a date for that. And then we can talk uh, comprehensively about what's happening with the project and, and what the next steps are. Okay, and yeah, just like I said, I, I just wanna understand sort of like the governance structure, how, what that looks like moving forward, what setup we have. Um, that's what I'm the most interested in there. And then the county infrastructure piece, what, the, I mean, what is that? What are we investing in there? I, I have no sense of what that is. So those are um, capital improvement projects, mostly deferred maintenance. So things that if we do not spend the money on them now, they're one time and done yeah. investments. Um, but if we, we don't do it now, it's gonna be much more expensive down the road. For sure. I just, if you could just give me a quick overview later of what those projects were. And I'll, yeah, I guess all of us <laughs> be helpful for all, just to know like, I guess what I'm hoping for is is a more detailed document that sort of outlines what you know what each of these categories are, and um, I don't need to know like you know just knowing the the broad headline of what the project is, and if I have more questions, I can go from there. But that would be really helpful. Absolutely, we have that material already prepared and can share it with the board. Figured you did. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Elise. In the interest of time, I'm going to move us on to the next presentation. Um, thank you. Um, so next up, we have a housing and homelessness response update from our executive director of OCED, Tony Kami. Kami, sorry. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to prepare and present an update related to our housing and homelessness response. Uh, some of the things that you will see on uh, the presentation are related to our winter weather response, as well as our housing access of Washtenaw County call center staffing. 
and our housing homelessness allocation progress update. Doesn't seem to be. It's okay. Our weather response was the daytime warning centers. The network was coordinated by SOC and our community partners. It utilizes both paid staff and volunteers and is available to the community seven days a week. Uh, they plan for record need and are meeting that need. County buildings are also available during our regular business hours. We also have overnight sheltering available. Hawk is the entry point for those referrals. Delanis phone line is available after hours, weekends, and holidays. And there is reported that we have capacity for all in need that have sought our services for that. SOC has hired almost 10 staff for support of the warming center locations. Uh, Dan Kelly let us know that information. And uh, he's attributing that additional support uh, to the BOC. Uh, and uh, sites are staffed up. And uh, we also want to know that uh, when Hawk is closed after 5 p.m. and weekends. Individuals may contact Delanis for immediate overnight shelter. We also have our Hawk Call Center staffing timeline. I know that's been a, a lot of conversation and wanted to update everyone on that. We currently have a temporary situation with our staffing, one call center supervisor, one court services coordinator, one HMIS coordinator, five call center intake operators, and we've been discussing our situation with the appropriate labor units. The ongoing discussions are currently in regard to three full-time equivalents for Hawk in regards to intake operators and one full-time equivalent for the Hawk supervisor. So those conversations were ongoing in the week of January 8th. Currently this week, we will be posting uh, positions uh, by the end of the week. And we are also working as is the uh, hybrid full-time permitted employee situation to have a location uh, for individuals when they are in office to be able to perform their duties out of. So a build out is uh, underway for planning purposes related to a permanent call center. And we are working with a uh, space in that is adjacent to the OCED offices. So that is what's going on currently and the official date uh, of uh, the hire for the full-time Hawk intake operators and supervisor is expected to be the week of January 29th. The current allocation plan that was approved by the Board of Commissioners included all the emergency shelter and rapid rehousing providers within the COC, as you see up on the screen. The contracts are in the hands of the system providers for their review final scopes of the services that they will be providing, as well as the spend down plans are expected to be sent back to us in the near future. Uh, the, all providers are currently uh, doing services for all of our residents and the image um, that we do have on the screen, I want to say is from uh, WHA. Up next, we have the Washington County Direct Cash Assistance Program, which was a total of $750,000, $375,000 for lump sums, and $375,000 for monthly payments. Uh, those are also a uh, contract for payment processor just cleared legal, legal review, excuse me, and implementation is anticipated by the end of January on that. Uh, and Hawk will be the access point for that funding. Related to eviction prevention and diversion, total of $645,000. SOS Community Services receiving $150,000. Uh, barrier Busters, $470,000. And County Administration, $25,000. Again, those contracts are with the providers. The goal is to support our existing residents who are awaiting assistance through HAWC and to direct new clients who go through intake assessment to this resource. We also have uh, barrier busters consistently running out of funding each quarter, and the influx of these resources will ensure broader eligibility, less restrictions, more countywide impact, and should not require eviction paperwork in the hand for residents for them to be able to access the support. 
Winter sheltering, a total of $375,000 in the allocation. The Shelter Association of Washtenaw County receiving $210,000 for the winter sheltering plan. Ozone House, $20,000 for general operations. Safe House, $20,000 for general operations. IHN, $125,000 for the family sheltering expansion staffing. Those contracts, again, are in the hands of the providers. All our existing COC system providers, the IHN family shelter expansion is going to increase family shelter capacity from six to 14 families. The city of Ann Arbor and the Ann Arbor Area Housing Commission are partners in this project along with IHN. And the space of the former dental clinic in Ann Arbor will be converted into office space, allowing for expansion at the Jackson Road shelter site to be able to accommodate the additional families. And just open for questions. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate the the um, detailed presentation. Um, my questions are kind of related to both barrier busters. I'm sorry, I'm starting first just because I had so many. Um, so barrier buster funding running through, um, I guess the eviction prevention dollars running through barrier busters. How is that gonna work process wise? which staff people are gonna be the ones making the determination? How are they interfacing with Hawk? Like, what does that actually look like? I guess, like, do we have capacity right now with our own staff to make sure that those dollars get out? Currently, um, our human services uh, team are working on developing all of the processes and procedures. They are in a conversation with our community partners to hear their voice and input on that as well. Uh, and so, of course, we do run very thin uh, related to staffing at OCED uh, and, and our bandwidth is stretched thin, uh, but we have a very dedicated staff and very diligent to serving the community to the best of their abilities. Okay, thank you. So we don't really have capacity. We could certainly use additional we, capacity. Yes, okay. That's um, kind of what I, what I thought. Um, and then with the, the temporary employees at Hawk, I saw that timeline. I don't know if we can pull that back up. Um, so employees were temporary. Like, I guess I'm wondering like what's going on with the temporary employees right now? Like, is there going to be a disruption with their employment before we, I know that we approve the funding to make those positions possible. I know we have something to approve tonight, but like what's going on right now? Like, are they still all working? Yes, our temporary Hawk staff, we're doing everything we can to retain our staff who have worked so diligently over the past um, 18 months, some of them, uh, to be able to um, continue the service that they've been delivering. We currently have the funding for three uh, of the intake operators and supervisor. Uh, I know that there is a um, resolution uh, that will come up later in today's uh, board meeting uh, that will hopefully uh, provide additional funding uh, through administration determination by uh, the, I believe, April 1st, the first board meeting in April. Uh, so in the interim, we would like to continue, of course, having the temporary staff do their positions uh, while we work on getting the positions that are not funded uh, in the presentation that you see uh, funded so that they too can become uh, permanent employees. Okay. And so, I mean, there could be potentially a disruption. I would hope that there would not be, but yes, there potentially okay. could be a disruption. Thank you. Um, we had Commissioner Robbie, Commissioner Scott, and Commissioner Sanders. Thank you, Chair. My question is very specifically about the um, Alpha House move. And um, you sort of broke that down a little bit for us, but um, help me understand the location. So I know their location on Jackson Road. So the, the plan is they're going to vacate their administrative offices and move downtown just a couple streets over to the city of Ann Arbor's Housing Commission owned building. And that vacating of their space will allow to build out more shelter space at the Alpha House location on Jackson. Is that? That's correct. Okay. Um, the house, so the build out that we are paying for is the build out at the shelter and the build out 
at the Ann Arbor Housing Commission building? Our or? funding is for the staffing uh, to be able to service those additional families uh, that will be residing at Alpha. So county dollars are not being used for the actual build out in either location? Because my, my initial understanding was that some of the money would be used for the build out, but, but if you're, yeah. What, what they had uh, requested uh, when we were talking to the city of Ann Arbor and the Ann Arbor uh, Housing Commission and um, Alpha House was funding related to staffing. Okay. To support those additional families. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I, like I said, so, uh, I was told along the way that it was involving the build out, but if, if it's just staffing, that's totally fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for, me for the presentation. I just want to put something on kind of the the radar. Right now it's freezing um, and we have to have a weather response and we have to have these daytime warming centers available for people. Um, I mentioned this at some point over the summer, but I want us to be ready for it again. We've had days that um, were extremely poor air quality um, this past spring and summer, and I'm talking beyond the regular ozone action days. And I'd really like to think about how the county responds to people who um, are unhoused or um, don't have a place to go to escape that bad air quality. And uh, even though there is literally ice on the inside of my windows right now at my house, clearly I need the weatherization people. Um, okay. But uh, but that that is coming upon us quick. So coming up with a plan for that um, also just want to put it on the radar. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Sanders, then on um, LaBar. Um, I wanted to ask about the um, the temporary employees. I wanted to understand, is there um, an expectation that the temporary employees just transition into these permanent positions or are these permanent positions going to be posted so that we have uh, wa other Washtenaw County residents eligible to apply for these positions? Chair, let me let me take that question. We, we expect to follow our labor contracts uh, around this item and they will be posted and uh, our current employees, those employees that are, are connected to our labor agreements will have the, the rights that are listed in their contracts. Now to the qu uh, question that was raised earlier, uh, and I apologize for not weighing in, it, it's always been our goal to make sure that there's a seamless transition around services and that there is no dis disruption so we can work down parallel paths or concurrently to ensure that uh, we have a, a stable service delivery model as we move through this conduit. But please know, I, I wanna say again, it's our expectation to, to honor the labor agreements as they're currently author, authored. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I mean, when, we, when I was uh, an active union member, that's pretty much how it worked. A temporary uh, employee did not supersede the rights of people that were already employed or already had their seniority established through um, the labor organization that they belong to. I just want to make sure um, that that is how we're looking at this. Um, my other question, um, Director Kaimumi, you may not have ever had the privilege of having me ask these questions because you're still a newbie, um, but I wanted to ask, I want to keep raising my concern about accountability for our um, nonprofit uh, community partners, um, especially as it relates to the customers that they service. I've had a concern in the past that um, we don't have a good check and balance. So if I show up uh, for support from one of these providers and they're rude or not responsive to me, um, I typically citizens don't know who to talk to, who to complain to. Um, and I'm not certain that there is a an incentive uh, for that agency to sort of self-police itself. So I'm interested in knowing for those that we are providing this funding to and are uh, providing a service to us in, in response to that funding, how do we know if the people that are 
in most need are being respected, responded to, and assisted. I, I just want to make sure that we're not, <clears throat> I have said that I am, I don't want to write a blank check and just pass it over and there's no accountability um, because who do they answer to? Technically, it's supposed to be the people that are paying them, but that's not. I've gotten enough responses from folks that uh, they're not always treated well. So I'm, I'm putting that out there, that I want to make sure that, that we make sure that our residents know and know enough to come out, to reach out to us and let us know. I contacted them, they didn't respond to me or they were nasty to me or even more demeaning to me than my current situation already is. So um, I don't know if um, OCED has addressed that or not, but I've been asking this for about the last mm, almost three years. We're currently exploring uh, the potential opportunity for a surveying um, system uh, to be able to inquire about not only our own service, but the service that our um, community members are receiving. We're just in the very initial exploratory stages of that, uh, but that is a conversation that has been raised amongst the human services team as something that uh, we would aspire to. Uh, we're investigating expense and the mechanisms of that. If I may, I just want to layer on uh, the director's comments and say, listen, we have had a, a longstanding framework in our community of who does what best. So when we partner with external agencies, we have an expectation that they can do certain things better, much better than we could internally. Uh, but uh, having said all of that, we certainly want to make sure that we have a check and balance system that uh, ensures that service de delivery happens to the expectation of not only the nine of you, but our community. So we're continuing to build that out. We're continuing to look at the what I refer to as the ecosystem around service delivery with an eye on making sure that we have measurable outcomes and that we're managing and allocating resources based upon those measurable outcomes. So more to come on this. Again, if, if we're gonna talk about it in terms of an ecosystem, it implies that we're gonna to continue to, to, to move through this evolution of creating uh, the very best service delivery model. Okay, so I just wanna have a last word on this one and say that oftentimes when you have what I would consider to be monopolies, you're the only one that's been doing the service forever, you get real lackadaisical. It's like being in a 40 year marriage and you just assume that your dinner is supposed to be here on the table at a certain time. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, everybody understands that um, just because you've been doing it doesn't mean that you've been doing it great. And it doesn't mean that you've been servicing people with the dignity that they deserve. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner Sanders. And then um, next we're gonna go to Commissioner Labar and Hodge, but I just wanna add one thing based on just the comments that the questions that I met, made earlier to follow up what, with what Administrator Jill mentioned. The reason why I, I kept asking and wanted to make sure, and I guess I want us all to know when we need to think about what we can do to allocate more resources towards staff to make sure that we're not running people super thin, especially when we just allocated so much money, $2.4 million. It's only $2.4 million for housing and homelessness if we get the dollars out. So I just want to make that clear. I, I raised that and really drilled in on that because I want us to all think about that because if we wait until April to decide that we need more staff, then that doesn't actually happen until August. And then we're back next winter. So um, that's all I just wanted to add to the context of my questions earlier. Commissioner Labar, then Hodge. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think it's worth repeating that uh, Director Kayumi came to us, I believe, uh, first part of November officially or second November part? November 6th, I think, oh. was my higher date. Um, so I think we're at a pivot point as an organization in terms of uh, how we're responding to homelessness. And that pivot point involves both uh, the staffing of OCED, not just the director position, but you know, top to bottom, do they have what they need? Um, 
but it also involves where we were at pre-pandemic with the system and structures we had up set, uh, set up via coordinated funding, and specifically the agreed upon expertise. Then the money that we heard from uh, our, our racial equity officer on earlier about uh, the ARPA dollars, that afforded us some flexibility, both in the amount and the use that is going away. And so I say all this because we had a continuum of care meeting uh, today and it, it, and it was useful. One of the things that I had asked to have on that agenda was feedback from those providers on the plan that we approved in November and what's working in terms of translating that from board action into human outcome. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot to uh, what we did that is working and that will work. There are some things I think that need ironing out and, 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 and clarity. But the biggest takeaway I got from that, and that I think is relevant to the nine of us and to the organization, we have a, a window of time here at the start of 2024, I think, to really galvanize our community to look at, okay, what do you want structurally for the next four or five years around homelessness now that we're getting out of ARPA uh, and, and the resources that provide it? I don't know the right way to do it, but what I do know is there, there are still some disconnects between what we see and hear at this table, what we see and hear as commissioners, what the staff is trying to do inside the organization in terms of strategic use of resources, making sure all boats are rowing in the same direction, doing all that, and then the reality on the ground that the providers are seeing. And I'm not asking us to adopt any one view of that, but I, I, I think we have to convene sometime before you know the end of uh, the school year, let's say, some greater discussion about what does 2025 look like? Um, because it was a point made today, that 2.4 that we allocated, and you know the other numbers that we've listed in the last several years, th those are worth repeating, uh, but largely those are, aside from new human services partnership, um, less strategic and more responsive to immediate and emerging need rather than sort of shaping uh, you know, the, the community. Uh, and I'd, I'd wrap up my remarks here, and Tony, forgive me, I, I should have asked a question, but I'm just talking. Um, I would like us to figure out the happy medium that we just talked about in terms of the expertise that providers provide us and the oversight and accountability that we need to provide uh, to our constituents and the public as a whole. I don't know the exact right answer, but I think it's worth finding an answer that keeps that partnership together because we do get a lot of flexibility and nimbleness with those providers. And they are providing a service that is funded in part or in whole by county government. So we, we, we need to answer that, uh, that question as best we can. Um, and I, I just, close there to say, Tony, welcome aboard. Um, I, I, I will say this. I appreciate, I think you've, you've dug in and, and gotten uh, into the work. And if there's anything the nine of us can do in terms of helping you build out those relationships in this new role, I hope you'll call on us um, and appreciate, you know, what you, what you've done so far. Thank you, chair. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, commissioner Hatch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Labar covered much of what I wanted to say. I wanted to thank you for the presentation. I know this is your first one before the board. I think it went well. Uh, I know it's challenging given the topic. Uh, the timelines on there, I think, uh, given when you joined the team uh, and where we're at right now, I think it's impressive with how quickly you've dug into the work and the progress we've made so far. I'm uh, particularly grateful for the progress made related to Hawk. Uh, the question I would ask, and it doesn't have to be an answer to this, but uh, if you as we go, let us know what needs you see related to Hawk so we can make sure that we're building that system up. Because uh, as we've talked about, and we, you know, Commissioner Somerville is very interested in this, and as is everyone else, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to give one person a shout out to imply others or not, but I think we're all very, we're all very uh, interested in making sure that the Hawk system works as intended um, because we, I mean, we really need that to function correctly so people can use that as the point of contact. Uh, so if you have ideas now, happy to hear them. If not, just be in touch about it because we want to make sure Hawk is working as intended. 
I mean, we are having some, some technology challenges that are being addressed uh, related to our provider, you know, for our, our phone systems. Um, we are, of course, wanting to continue to staff our human services department uh, adequately to be able to provide um, the best services that we can to our community partners, to the community that we serve, uh, and to be able to you know, look at our current structure and know that uh, Commissioner Somerville, you mentioned um, additional staffing and uh, resources for that. We feel that we know that we need at least an additional supervisor in the human services department because it is such a broad range of services that are offered and some are very policy specialized where others are more direct service specialized and that's two different spectrums of knowledge and experience uh, and would like to be able to add an additional supervisor because right now we only have one uh, for that department and knowing that we need additional administrative support we are overseeing so many grants uh, that require a lot of reporting and work that being able to have those two additional positions in addition to stabilizing Hawk uh, with the permanent staffing uh, would be some immediate needs that we would love to see um, funding for related to our human services department. We feel that that would uh, improve the services that we can to offer to community. Great, and I believe we can achieve all of that. Uh, I'm particularly right now thinking about the technology challenges. So last year when we had significant issues related to the technology that I mean, that seems like the low hanging fruit for something that we should be able to fix. Uh, so there's something that we can do to be helpful with that, let us know, uh, because in thinking about the system as a whole, I would not want technology to be the barrier. That should be the thing we should be able to just take care of, I would hope relatively easily. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on, I'm gonna go to Commissioner Light and then um, if anybody else that hasn't spoke yet, and then I'll go back to Commissioner Rappi. Um, thank you for the presentation and um, I, we appreciate it and I too agree that you are doing a wonderful job thus far. Um, you have jumped into what I call a little bit of a hot mess and I appreciate you for, for doing so. Um, I just, for the board, I want us to make sure that we, um, accountability, uh, that's going to be the word for me um, going forward. And just if you let us know, um, because I personally um, would like to be hands-on with how we can best um, accommodate and make sure that um, OCD has um, all the things that are needed, and especially in the, in the area of with Hawk. Um, I have been um, working close, closely with individuals and organizations, um, and Hawk is the first point of contact. And um, I just want to make sure uh, that things go smoothly for our residents and um, and and even for our employees. So um, I would definitely myself would like to be um, a little more hands on. And whatever you need, please reach out directly um, because it is something very important to me that we make sure that we. Um, have a very smooth and fast transition with everything. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robbie. <laughs> um, you can save remember, it for a later I remember, day. <laughs> I remember. Thank you, Chair. Uh, some of the comments that were made earlier, this is just building off of that. Uh, this is um, obviously a big investment of money that we're making. Um, one of the longstanding concerns that I've always had is just something I want to reemphasize, which is, you know, I think a lot of people don't, and this was sort of talked about by others too, but a lot of people don't understand um, the breadth of county investment in our community. Um, and I think a lot of that is because when we invest in service providers, um, they are providing services under their brand. Uh, and it is not necessarily true that the county's contribution to those services are always recognized. Um, and when I say the county, I, you know, it, as a reminder, we all know this, but the taxpayers of Washtenaw County are the contributors that make that those services possible. And just like for the road millage where there are signs that say this is paid for by the taxpayers of Washtenaw County, um, I would like to find ways that we can emphasize that with our service providers and ensure that both the people that are receiving the services, but also our community members are understanding the breadth of services that are being received um, and that they are county funded services, even though it may be a service provider that's actually 
you know, where the person walks in, et cetera. So it's not unusual. I know that many foundations and other funders request logo placement um, on websites and on marketing materials to be able to share where funding has come from uh, on certain um, programs and services that are being offered. If that was something we wanted uh, to consider um, asking of or making part of our contractual agreements in the future uh, related to logo placement of the county logo specifying that county funds from taxpayer dollars help to pay for some of these. I think that's really important. Thank you. Great suggestion. Um, I know that I've talked about that with you before and um, Commissioner Hodge, Chair Hodge. Um, all right. Well, seeing none, no other uh, questions. Uh, Tony, thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the presentation and you entertaining all of our questions and comments. Um, and seeing that we have no current or future items, I will now entertain, entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye.
Oh, you got the camera on me and everything. Thanks. All right. Good evening, everybody. We're going to call the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners meeting on October, January, not October, January 17th, 2024 to order. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Bryce, we just started with a roll call. Commissioner Beeman. Present. Commissioner Hodge. Present. Commissioner Labar. Here. Commissioner Light. Present. Commissioner Machieski. Here. Commissioner Robbie. Commissioner Sanders. Present. Commissioner Scott. Here. Commissioner Somerville. Here. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And the team is all here. All right, before we get into public participation, we have a few guests, at least two. Uh, here with us today. I'm going to look in the, the back. Is, there, is our third guest here? That's a thumbs down. Okay, so we will get started with our other guests. Uh, and by doing that, we're going to take a uh, report of the county administrator out of order today. So go ahead and take it away, Greg. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for the flexibility. I'm pleased to introduce the new Chief Judge of the Trial Court, Patrick Conlon, and the Chief Judge of the 14A District Court, Anna Freshour. Uh, we invited them this evening so that you can put a face with a name if you didn't already know it and I'll afford them an opportunity to have a few words with you all. So uh, judges, take it away. Put your coats on. <laughs> it's freezing. It's cold outside. <laughs> Could the commission do something about that? Uh, I think we're both here just for the same reason. Just uh, we're both brand new, uh, newly appointed chief judges and of the 14A, just of the 14th district court and the trial court. And I just wanted to sort of come down and say hello and uh, introduce myself. I know a couple of you, but not many. So it's nice to put some faces to your names as well. And uh, just want to be good neighbors and good partners. Yes, and looking forward to working with all of you in the upcoming year. And if there's any concerns, then certainly reach out to either of us. Yeah, please. Well, thank you for being here, your honors. Uh, you are welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting if you'd like. Uh, we try to have a, a good meeting here, uh, or you could also stream it or watch the recording, uh, but you don't have to stay. Does anybody have any questions or comments for the judges? Yeah, oh, Commissioner Sanders, you were quick on the draw. I'm going to say that I do, and I will delay it because we have a full audience, but um, Judge Conlon, I do at some point want to have a conversation with you, and I'm glad that you said that you want to be good neighbors and good partners because I have a concern about that related to the court. Okay. But I'll leave it there. I'm sure that you understand what my concerns are or you've been shared that information um, and we can finish this up at a later date. But I would like for the two of you to share exactly the court houses that are under your purview for the sake of our residents. Because it's kind of, you know, you give us a much total. more complicated answer to that than I did. So. <laughs> So 14A is 14A1, 14A2, 14A3, and 14A4. We're in Saline, Chelsea, Ypsilanti, and Pittsfield Township. So our jurisdiction is all of Washtenaw County except the city of um, Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti Township. Thank you. And so my courthouse or our courthouse is, is a half a block up this way. So it's the main county courthouse. It houses what uh, we call the trial court. Historically was the probate and the circuit courts together. And so we, we are uh, under our roof, our um, felony criminal disposition, um, domestic custody uh, matters, um, the general civil, we also have the juvenile court and then the probate court, the, which is historically the wills and trusts and protecting individuals. So those are the, those are the areas that we do. We, have, we are a trial court, which means that as a local um, organization, our seven judges act to fulfill all of those rather than historic circuit court and probate court judges and, and assignments. So the seven of us parse that. So, and we're right up the street. Thank you for that. Okay. Commissioner Somerville. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you both for coming. And um, I knew one of you um, by name and face, but not the other. So I appreciate um, the opportunity and for residents to put a face with the name as well. So thank you. Sure. Pleasure. Absolutely. Commissioner Robbie. Yes. Given that we have a bunch of people here to speak during public comment, I don't want to go on, but I just wanted to say to both of you, congratulations. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Light. 
I too want to say congratulations and I look forward to um, partnering and, and having the better relationships. Um, and I just look forward to and meeting all of the other judges as well. So let them know I'm ready to meet and greet. Okay, that sounds great. Well, uh, we'll get we'll get a, a, a ice cream social. Meeting. <laughs> that sounds great. No, happy to and uh, today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but thank you. Thanks very much for the good work that you all do for all of us and uh, and look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Commissioners, I'll just say that they've both been uh, proven themselves to be great partners. We will continue that in the future and uh, look forward to the relationship moving forward. And with that, that will conclude my report. Excellent. Well, drive safe uh, or feel free to stick around. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Our next special guest is ready. So let's approach the podium. Chair, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Administrator Dill, as many of you know, uh, one of our uh, long-term employees here at the county, Brenda Kerr, has uh, retired. She actually formally retired at the end of the year. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Brenda for two and a half of those 20 years. And what I experienced was very consistent with the feedback that I got from leadership across the county. And that was dedication to service, the person that you knew you could go to to get the right answers, and somebody that was committed to pick up the phone anytime, night or day, to solve the problems uh, that needed to be solved in IT. I, I'm going to kind of go through the uh, resolution that uh, was put before you and uh, you guys uh, signed earlier today. And uh, I'm going to read it, actually. So Brenda began her employment at, with Washtenaw County in 2023 and then is retired after 20 years of dedicated public service. Ms. Kerr started her career as the uh, Information Technology Services Department as the Web and Java Development Supervisor. Uh, Brenda was uh, promoted in 2005 to the Technology Applications Supervisor, which is the role she uh, left the county in. Uh, she earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Computer Science from Michigan Tech. Uh, Brenda also was very, very active and well-respected in uh, industry as well as governmental uh, organizations that focus on IT in public service. She was a person that they would seek out, uh, not only within Washtenaw County, but other peer organizations around the state for advice and direction, because they knew they'd get the best direction and advice. Uh, Brenda uh, earned the respect and, uh, of her team and her coworkers as well as leadership, uh, really by uh, uh, just delivering exceptional knowledge, service, and dedication uh, to the county. Again, she was my go-to person, as well as the go-to person for almost every leader across the county. Uh, she led the efforts to deploy and support many of the IT applications that are in place today that enable the county to uh, actually deliver the uh, critical services that they do to the individuals within Washtenaw County. Uh, she was instrumental in streamlining a lot of the uh, 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 processes that are used throughout the county, uh, taking a lot of those processes and taking them from paper to digital, which is a, a big deal. Uh, those uh, included uh, our time tracking, uh, included our open enrollment process, in our day one process to mention a few. Uh, and Brett has consistently demonstrated a strong commitment to the vision and the values of Washtenaw County and really has de dedicated the majority of her career to public service. So at this point, Brenda, is there anything you'd like to add or like to say? Not really, but thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> I've really enjoyed my time at the county. Um, you know, and he talked about easy when I first came to the county, the county was doing paper timesheets. So just imagine that everyone in the county and every county building is collecting their paper timesheets and turning them in. So it was the first thing I worked on was to make that not a paper process, but um, it's been great. Worked with everybody throughout the county and I've really enjoyed uh, working with the county and throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
All right. Well, we have some time for commissioners to make any comments. I believe Commissioner Robbie wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I do. Uh, I just wanted to comment, Brenda. Um, thank you for your service to the county. Uh, you know, I've known you since probably for 15 years now, and uh, you were my constituent for a significant chunk of that time. And uh, I got to work with you at the county, of course, in your capacity here. And I just want to say, you know, public service is not easy. It's not how you make the big bucks. You are a talented individual that, you know, knows what you're doing. And the fact that you spent uh, the last 20 years uh, in service of the people of our county uh, is a testament to your, uh, you know, to your character. And so I just want to thank you and congratulate you on your service, on your retirement. I hope that you get some rest. And I, I, I'm kind of doubtful knowing you that you actually will, but please get some rest. You deserve it. You've worked very hard and uh, we all love you very much. And, you know, all the best to you in your next endeavors. Yeah. All right. Administrator Dill. Yeah, just want to echo Brenda. Uh, I've known you for your, for the full time that you've been here. And I'll just say to the organization, we don't often think about what happens behind the IT curtain. Um, but I will say to you, without a doubt, anytime you pull back the curtain, likely the first person that you're going to see is Brenda Kerr. She's just been just a rock for IT. And I just want to say thank you and, and best wishes as you move forward. Anybody else? Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much for your service to Washtenaw County. And we hope you have something great planned. All right. We will now move into public participation. So I'm going over the rules for public participation or how it works. So here at the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners, you get three minutes for public comment. Uh, if you're in the room, you'll join us at the podium and we have a great light color coded system that starts on green, goes down to yellow when you have one minute left and then goes to red when you don't have any time left. At that point, I'll have to stop you from talking. I don't wanna have to do that. So just stop You know, when you get to the three minutes. Uh, if you're joining us online uh, via Zoom, you will hit the raise hand icon. You will be identified. Uh, then you will give your three minutes of public comment. For those of you that are online, I believe we will have a timer that will appear, so you'll be able to see how much time you have left. If you're joining us via Zoom uh, by phone, you will hit the star six icon to raise your hand. Nope, you will hit star nine to raise your hand. I'll call on you. You'll hit star six to unmute yourself. Uh, if you, when you give public comment, you need to state your name uh, in the city or township that you live in. Um, for our record, if you forget to do that, I will have to remind you because uh, I don't want to get Bryce mad at me because he needs it for the record. So I'll have you have to have you do that. I would say that uh, I expect that there will be significant public comment tonight. My uh, expectation is that we will have public comment that will be respectful uh, to everyone in the room. Uh, so we will get through the public comment. And we will all hear you. And after public comment is when commissioners have an opportunity to respond. We it's not a conversation. It's, that's just not how the board rules work. So you, everyone will give public comment. Then we'll have an opportunity to respond. So you'll have to wait if you want to hear our response to that. Would anybody in the room like to give public comment? If so, please come on down to the podium. You don't have to raise your hand. You could just. Good evening. My name is Rachel Lipson. I'm a resident of Ann Arbor and a member of the Jewish community. And I wanted to thank you all for putting forth the ceasefire resolution and recommending that you pass it. Indiscriminate bombing and starving of civilians in the name of Judaism does not make Jews safe abroad or here in Washtenaw County. The safety of Israeli hostages is also at risk as they are also bombed and shot by the IDF while unarmed and waving white flags. Experiencing oppression does not give you immunity from becoming an oppressor and using accusations of anti-Semitism as a tactic to deflect accountability for war crimes is a perversion of Judaism. This standpoint is not anti-Semitic. In fact, Bernie Steinberg, the executive director of Harvard Hillel for 18 years has warned against the cynical weaponization of anti-Semitism by powerful forces who seek to intimidate and ultimately silence legitimate criticism of Israel and of American policy on Israel. He has also summarized an integral part of why I stand before you today. There is no tradition more central to Judaism than prophetic truth-telling, no Jewish imperative more urgent than bravely criticizing corrupt leadership. If we don't use every available channel to amplify our voices against the leadership that is intent on using our tax dollars to continue this massacre happening in the Middle East, we are complicit. I applaud the efforts of Washtenaw County to remind our leadership in Michigan and federally that we will not stay silent and we will not be complicit. Violence begets violence and the tragic events of October 7th were predicated on years of violent oppression. 
that violence has been documented internationally as well as by Israeli human rights organizations such as B'Tselem. In turn, the likelihood of Israel destroying Hamas with violence seems about as likely to be successful as we were at destroying the Taliban. As of January 13th, according to the New York, New York Times, no Hamas leadership has been killed in Gaza. What has been killed and destroyed are homes, hospitals, civilian infrastructure, and 20,000 people, more than 20,000 people, um, leaving over 1.8 million people still suffering without shelter, without warm clothes, without clean water, sufficient food or medicine. Even with the ceasefire, this is a humanitarian crisis. Let me remind you that Anne Frank did not die in a gas chamber. She died of a preventable disease crammed into unsanitary conditions in Bergen-Belsen. For me personally, to remain silent in the face of the atrocities happening in Gaza and the West Bank would be an affront to my great-grandparents who survived similar efforts to eradicate them in the pogroms. And I hope that you can tell your great-grandchildren that you also did everything that you could and stood up to stop a genocide that you called for a ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Avi Taknafram. Uh, I'm a resident of Ann Arbor. Um, I want to speak today in favor of the um, resolution condemning hate and urging for a bilateral ceasefire. Um, I want to speak to some of the experiences I've had surrounding hatred I've received um, in Washtenaw County. So I, for reference, I'm a member of the Ann Arbor Jewish community. Um, and on October 5th, um, I was attending a demonstration in solidarity with those in Palestine who um, experienced apartheid even before the ongoing genocide, even before the escalation of the ongoing genocide that has occurred since October 7th. You know, these people are living in apartheid conditions. And um, so I was attending a demonstration in solidarity with those people. Um, a silent and peaceful demonstration where we simply stood and we held cards saying, explaining what was going on. Um, and the experiences that I've had with that um, is that while I was, you know, silently and peacefully, you know, holding my cards, I, I was mob, mobbed by a group of Zionist students and non-students, um, people that, some of whom are actually in this room right now. Um, they came up to me, they shoved cameras in my face, they asked me how the hell I could do this as a Jew, they questioned my Judaism, they questioned my right to be who I am. Um, and what I want to say is that this resolution would go a long way towards mending these sorts of hatred that many of us in the community feel from, you know, Zionists who mob us on the street, who for many of the Muslim and Arab residents of this community call them terrorists. Say these peaceful and loving people, they call them terrorists. Um, and I also want to say that um, as a Jewish person, as someone who had family that survived and most of whom did not the Holocaust, um, there's a, there's a look you can see in someone's eyes, the eyes of a person that is experiencing genocide. It's the same look that I saw um, in the picture of my great, great aunt um, as she's getting off the train to Auschwitz. It's a look of desperation, it's a look of fear, it's a look of hatred, and more than anything, it's a look of um, emptiness at your entire community, your entire life being destroyed. And this is the same, it's the same look in the eyes of the people in Gaza. Um, it's the same look, it's the same emptiness, hatred, fear, and depression, destitution. Um, and this resolution is not everything that is needed, but it'll go a long way to mending some of the, some of the divisions in this community. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Luna. I'm a resident of Ann Arbor. So November of 2024 will mark 10 years since the Ann Arbor Police Department killed Aura Rosser in her home. Aura Rosser was known to the police who killed her as someone struggling with mental health issues and someone who used drugs. 
Indeed, they had been to her home on numerous occasions and failed to meaningfully address the perpetual state of crisis in her life. Law enforcement methods of bringing public safety deepened the crisis in her life and ultimately killed her. Three months after her death, the county prosecutor and other officials would use her mental health and drug use as a justification for killing her and suppress facts that showed she was a victim of domestic violence throughout her life, including the night of her death, rather than the perpetrator she was painted to be. So it is right that in the year before this 10th anniversary, you are considering renewal of the public safety and mental health millage. No doubt a significant portion of those dollars have gone to essential care and access to services in our county. But it is unclear how many of those dollars have gone to the very tools of violence that killed Aura Rosser, police involvement in mental health crisis, guns, and tasers. I ask you to publish a comprehensive report of how millage dollars were spent over the last four years, and specifically how many of those dollars end up in the sheriff's office already the most funded department in the county and what they are used for. If the millage is renewed, at minimum, it should include ongoing transparency about how dollars are being used and how it is preventing crisis in the lives of our neighbors. Aura's killing, current tent sweeps on the coldest nights of the year, the overwhelming reliance on our winter warming centers for survival, and the current siege on Gaza that has killed 30,000 Palestinians and displaced nearly 2 million are devastating reminders of how our public dollars, locally and abroad, are disproportionately spent on tools of violence rather than meeting people's material and social needs. Let's use tonight's meeting and every meeting for the rest of the year to expand our imaginations of what public safety and mental health preservation means. Bare minimum, it means divesting from military aid abroad and calling for a permanent ceasefire in Palestine. It means continuously investing in and sustaining local initiatives that meet people's material needs, including dignified housing for all. It means preventing sweeps of tents that people rely on for survival and dispersing winter sheltering funds before winter rather than after. It means access to meaningful crisis support without police involvement with a provider who isn't overburdened and underpaid. Let's dedicate every day of the rest of this year to not just the words, but the deeds that bring about a free Palestine, justice for our Rosser and dignified housing for all. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, respected commissioners. My name is Christine Abu Lahar, and I'm here to speak in favor of the resolution with the long name, the resolution denouncing rising hate and discrimination in Washtenaw County and calling for a lasting bilateral ceasefire in Gaza and Israel. I represent my family tonight, my husband and I in District 2 and various ones of my children and grandchildren in District 6, 7, and 9. We thank those of you who brought this resolution to a vote and ask that each and every one of you vote yes. We want to live in a community where everyone is respected and treated with dignity and can exercise their rights to advocate without being harassed or intimidated. We are especially pleased to see that the resolution condemns doxing. We know that all of you want the same for your families, and we believe it is time for you as elected government officials to reaffirm our community's values as put forth in the resolution. We also believe that calling for a lasting bilateral ceasefire and sufficient humanitarian aid is part of that. Trauma, mourning, a sense of dehumanization and anxiety over the future are affecting large segments of our population here. There are a slew of people here tonight asking the same and another slew of people at Pioneer High School asking the same of Ann Arbor Public Schools. We're here because we care very much and we won't give up. And we're here because we're reaching out to and watching our elected officials. I'll just say that there's a person in the White House who will not be receiving our vote. I know that all of us here have heard over and over statistics of the number of Palestinians and Israelis killed since October 7 but I urge that we not let ourselves become numb to the numbers, lest our hearts become numb to the horror of it all. When I think of more than 24,000 Palestinians having been killed so far, I think of my husband, my children, and their spouses and my grandchildren. What pain would I feel if they all were killed? And then I think of that happening to family after family after family. 
To make it worse, international agencies predict that the number of Palestinians killed is expected to double in the next month due to lack of clean water, food, and medicine. While I have time, I want to emphasize that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. To purport that being against the colonial settler, apartheid, oppressive, genocidal, occupying Zionist Israeli state is the same as being against Jewish people is a falsehood. I will conclude by saying that my family and I see this resolution as the bare minimum, simple, and offensive to no one. We ask that you take a stance as leaders of our community and vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. I need your city or township. City or township? Webster Township. All right, Bryce. Okay, we just needed yours, but thank you. All right, who's next? Hi, my name is Dennis Gundus, and I'm here because you can make a difference. I'm here to ask you to call for a bilateral ceasefire resolution. I'm here because our American tax dollars are funding a genocide in Gaza. Why should the average person in Washtenaw County care about what happens in Gaza? According to USCPR.org, Ann Arbor gives annually 1.8 million to Israel. Ypsilanti, 300,000. Chelsea, 100,000. Milan, 90,000. Celine, 135,000. Dexter, $65,000. Annually, Washtenaw County gives almost $2.5 million to Israel. I am a taxpayer of Washtenaw County. Like Commissioner Rabhi said earlier, we the taxpayers fund services here. I do not consent to my tax dollars funding a settler colonial state, an illegal occupation of the country of Palestine. I do not consent the Israeli IDF sending American bombs killing over 30,000 civilians. I do not consent to homeless out here in Ann Arbor freezing while you send money there when it, you can provide shelter and more services and government housing for them here. I do not consent to my tax dollars funding free education in Israel while Americans here are in student loan debt. I do not consent to my tax dollars being used to provide, provide Israelis with free health care while we have people here in Washtenaw County in medical debt or unable to afford medical health care. And to the Zionists who claim to live in fear, I ask, do you feel safer now in January than you do in November? Because in November, 10,000 Gazans were killed, and now there are 30,000 killed. Do you feel safer now that the numbers increased? What number do you need in order to feel safer halfway across the world here in Ann Arbor? To claim that you somehow need to feel safe and need to bomb others is ridiculous. We can no longer purposefully conflate Zionism and Judaism, just like we cannot conflate Islam and terrorism. Thank you to our Jewish brothers here and sisters who asked for a ceasefire and a resolution here today. South Africa has charged Israel um, with apartheid and recognizes apartheid and charged Israel with genocide at the International Court of Justice. How do you think this issue reached that court? In rooms like this, in meetings like this, and when people say, oh, this should not be discussed here, this is exactly where it starts. This matters here in Ann Arbor. And to quote Nelson Mandela, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of Palestinians. Thank, Thank you. you. I need your city or township. Ann Arbor, all right. All right, come on down next. Name, city, and township. I'll remind everybody. Uh, Jessica Decky Alexander, Ann Arbor. <clears throat> Following October 7th, where Hamas massacred 1,200, injured 6,000, and took 240 hostages, we, members of the Jewish community writ large, convened elected officials and asked them this, that as the war moves forward and you may be confronted to craft resolutions, please reach back out to us. I am here today to thank you for your outreach and your thoughtfulness as you shape this resolution based on the city of Ann Arbor's. However, because Jews rightly or wrongly are often lumped together with Israel and its actions, adopting any resolution which calls Israel's actions into question leads members of the community to blame Jews 
for those actions. Any statement and or public comment must clearly address this and condemn anti-Semitism, anti-Israel hate and Jew hatred, to be clear. Making such a statement without addressing this world's other conflicts where hundreds of thousands of Arabs have been killed in Syria and Yemen singles out this conflict as the world's only Jewish state and that is anti-Semitic. Since 2015, this county commission has issued thousands of resolutions, but how many of them have specifically addressed a geo-global conflict and asked for specific military action to be taken? I'm sure the answer is most likely none. So most Jews are finding these local resolutions not about a war 6,000 miles away, but about Jews and Muslims without nuance on history, resulting in cracks in our county's socio-cultural ecosystem antidote. We, we, a U of M faculty member, Muslim who lives in my ward, struck up a conversation at one of the six hour marathon A2 city council meetings. His voice needed to be at the table and thus I shared his contact info with those constructing the A2 city resolution. Last week as that resolution was being voted on, we ended up driving in at the same time and parking on the same side street. I waited for him as we were set to walk in together, but then he told me not to wait, to just go in. And in that moment, I realized he did not want to walk in with me, not me, who is this local political, a professor, theater artist, poetry slammer, and co-launched the first college and prison program for Michigan, for women in Michigan, not me, Decky, but a Jew. The resolution you are looking to pass is community facing. It does not include language that incites, but it is not a resolution that will bring members of this Jewish and Muslim community together, whether on a side street or a town hall or here. Yes, sometimes the statement speaks for all, but this one, as inclusive as it strives to be, is simply a gateway to further resolutions on Israel, Gaza, or against Jews. This is how it starts, Jessica, the ancestors say. This resolution took aside will not foster community, but will just be recorded as a win so the group of activists can move on to the next council, the next commission, while you and I are left here still believing that community can heal all. Thank you. Next person, come on down. Name, city, and township. Hi, um, my name is Abe. I live in Ann Arbor, so I think that's Ann Arbor Township. I'm also a first generation immigrant from Israel. And as I got older, I got a deeper understanding of what that actually means. And I had a lot of conversations with my family, both here and those remaining in Israel, about why it is that I can go back there whenever I want, but families who have lived there for generations still lack the right of return. And that word came up a lot, that this issue is complex, that this issue is, it's not as simple as black and white. And I think as dubious as that has ever seemed, it's paper thin and see-through now, because there isn't nuance in dropping 2,000 pound unguided ordinance on densely packed residential areas. There isn't shades of gray to Israel unilaterally shutting off the water, food, and medicine for Gaza. There isn't a silver lining to 10 Palestinian children every day getting amputations without anesthesia. And where we come in and as United States citizens is that without America's military, Israel would face impunity. Without our vote at the United States Security Council 56 times blocking resolutions that would punish Israel for uh, it breaking human rights and international war crimes. It would not be able to escalate this conflict as it does today. And at some point, uh, we have to decide if that is who we are or not. And this resolution is it's a first step in a long road of reparations to the Palestinian people, both those still remaining alive in Gaza in awful conditions and those who have been diasporated across the world. And uh, I think this is a good way to signal to our state and federal legislators that this isn't who we are. And as a Jew from Israel, I know more than anything that you want to lash out at people who attack it. But at some point, the blood of Gazans won't make you safer, as a lot of people before me have stated. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Name, city or township? Good evening, commissioners. My name is Rita Shaw, S-H-A-H, and I'm an Ann Arbor resident. You've heard many reasons tonight to support a bilateral ceasefire as resolution, as well as in other arenas, such as the Ann Arbor City Council meetings and the Ypsilanti City Council meetings. I'd like to give you one more. We are being told every day that the November election is a vote for democracy, and yet representatives across the country have ignored the vast majority who support a ceasefire. Because of that, many of us have lost faith in our democratic institutions and lost faith that our voice matters. And yet, here we are. 
either standing in front of you or sitting in front of you, using our voice and exercising our democratic right. We come before you not in despair, but in hope. Hope for a better, more peaceful world. Hope that democracy is alive and well. Hope that our voice still matters. So as you consider your voice vote on the ceasefire resolution tonight, please consider this. A no vote will only confirm that we should despair, but a yes vote, a yes vote shows that we are right to hope. Thank you. Thank you. All right, name, city or township. Hi, my name is David. I'm from, uh, or I live in Ann Arbor. Um, and I'm here also speaking uh, in favor of the uh, resolution in favor of a, a bilateral ceasefire. Um, I just want to speak a little bit. I'm a, I'm a Jewish member of the community. I'm a relatively new member of the community, but I actually grew up coming here a lot. Um, my grandfather taught at the University of Michigan, and I have an extended family here. And I was always impressed. I was taken by the humanitarian and the progressive and the enlightened ideals that I, I saw in the Washington County and, and Ann Arbor community. Um, and I think this is a moment where we're really kind of coming up to the test. Um, this is a moment where for over 100 days we've been experiencing genocide in Gaza. And we have members of our community who are part of the Palestinian community as well as the extended Arab and Muslim communities that are also impacted by this. And they're members of our community. And we have a taboo against even being able to say that their pain matters, that it's significant. And we're funding that that pain. And I think that that is something that we need to be able to take a stand against here in this community to really live up to the values that I've observed since I was a child. I think that not only should we be, should we divest our money from this, but we should in the very, very least be able to say that this is not okay. And I think that there, as a Jewish person, I do not want to have such an inequality with my, my Arab, Palestinian and Muslim brothers and sisters in the value of my life, where my life or a false sense of safety could be more valuable than, their, than an acknowledgement of their anguish and their pain. So I ask you as a member of the Jewish community to please uh, pass this resolution for a ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you. All right, name, city or township? Uh, Welby Seeley from Ann Arbor. I'm here tonight to add my voice to the rising chorus calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to Israel's occupation. A chorus that is comprised not only of my brothers and sisters here tonight, but that of almost the entire international community. The United States stands increasingly alone in not only supporting, but escalating a war that has killed over 25,000 people, nearly all civilians, and displaced yet another 2 million. We vetoed a UN resolution on humanitarian pauses to deliver life-saving aid to millions of victims in Palestine, twice. And now, within the past few days, we've escalated and expanded the conflict by bombing Yemen, a country already mired in humanitarian crisis from years of civil war. This is not just a blemish on our country. Our hands are soaked in blood. If the administration was serious about peace, we would have a ceasefire tomorrow. The administration and its patrons need to be pressured. We have a responsibility, not only as citizens of this country, but as human beings to do everything in our power to end this slaughter. Our voice matters. I'm here to ask you to pass the resolution that calls for a lasting bilateral ceasefire in Gaza and Israel. Stand with us and let's do everything we can to make this right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, come on down, whoever's next. Name, city, or township. Hello, my name is Nathan Rosenberg from Ann Arbor. I'm not here to discuss my interpretation and my feelings about the issues going on in Israel. What I am here is to discuss this petition and what it's doing to the Jews on campus at the University of Michigan. We see that increased rhetoric in regards to these conversations is creating a point of divisiveness. It's creating conversations that are only creating a larger divide. It is our goal to create stronger conversation. I, I, I'm frankly inspired by passion and by, I'm hurt by the pain that other people are felt, feeling. And, and these conversations need to be had in unity, 
not through petitions where we can't have the opportunity to discuss and not argue in heat, but argue in passion and argue for what we love. Under God, we are a nation that promotes peace, equality, equity, but we're not trying to create this divisive nature here. We're trying to create this sense of unity in the United States of America. And this petition is only causing divisiveness. It's only causing distinction between one side and the other. And, and I'm not asking for rhetoric regarding one way or the other. That, that's not what I'm here to push. What I'm here to push is to stop pushing these petitions forward. To, to, to end these, these points of conflict. We're looking to resolve them. We're looking to create this form of peace internally so this peace can expand outwards. That's our goal here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, name, city, or township. Murat Idris, Ann Arbor, District 7. Uh, I am here to encourage you to vote for this very simple resolution that calls for peace. Uh, it is a bare bones resolution. It is the bare minimum that we can do. And uh, there's no reason for anyone to feel harmed, hurt, or threatened by it. It is a call for peace. It is the result of num numerous compromises. And I just wanna name some of these compromises. This is a resolution that doesn't need to mention the number of people killed, Palestinian children whose limbs have been amputated, or the number of men, women, and families that have been erased. 11,000 children. <clears throat> More than 10 children each day for the last three months, on average, have lost one or both legs in Gaza, and this includes babies. That's a lifetime of pain management and medical care. It doesn't mention that the Gaza Strip is the size of Detroit, around 140 square miles, but Gaza has three times the population. The largest city in Gaza is more densely populated than New York City. That's how small and dense it is. This is where also half of Gaza's population is under 18. So we're looking at 1 million children. Our bombs are falling on children. This is why Dr. Hassan Ousite, who was treating children there for the first few weeks, called it a war on children. He reported what new types of missiles and bombs do to human flesh and bones child-sized flesh and child-sized bones. 2.2 million people in Gaza are experiencing catastrophic levels of hunger through a man-made famine, food on the other side of the border. Over 70% of all homes have been destroyed. Bernie Sanders said that these three months have been more destructive than the whole two years of a bombardment of Dresden. Leading scholars of genocide all over the world have warned us that this is not good. The resolution doesn't need to mention that in 2022, 18 journalists were killed in Ukraine and 67 worldwide, but over 109 journalists have been killed in Gaza alone. With the assassination of journalists, there's also the political campaign to deny them the status of journalist or civilian. There's, of course, also a national campaign to cr criminalize speech for Palestinian freedom and equality here. This is not a resolution that mentions 75 years of occupation, 18, an 18 year siege or October 7th or the number of children killed in the West Bank before October 7th. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to mention attacks on civilian infrastructures, including 600 attacks on vital medical infrastructures. 375 doctors and nurses have been killed. It doesn't mention political prisoners. It doesn't mention administrative detention. It doesn't mention professors who've been killed, researchers who've been killed. It doesn't mention US military aid or taxes. There's so much it doesn't need to say. It, this is a call for peace. These are the compromises that people have made in order to bring this kind of resolution forward. And we stand in favor of it. And I ask you to please call, uh, uh, to please vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Time. All right, next up. All right, name, city, or township? Hey, my name is Ben Korsh. I live in Ann Arbor, and I'm going to read a letter from my rabbi. Dear council members, I am honored to serve as the rabbi of Congregation Tekia, a progressive, justice-pursuing, queer-loving, intergenerational, reconstructionist Jewish community. Our members live in Wayne, Oakland and Washtenaw counties, including Ann Arbor. Speaking out for a ceasefire is a religious imperative. The only path to true and lasting safety for both Israelis and Palestinians is not through violence and war. We need engagement by the international community towards a just and lasting peace in this land, which is holy to so many. 
I speak out for a ceasefire not in spite of October 7th, but because of it. One of my best friends lives in Eshkelon, very close to Gaza with her two beautiful children. The only thing that, we'll, that will keep them safe is a just peace, and we cannot bomb our way there. The only people benefiting from continued war are the weapons manufacturers. That's it. But I don't imagine that the question you're asking is whether a ceasefire is necessary or just, but rather what role does our commission of a small uh, county have in responding to a crisis across the world so clearly outside of your jurisdiction? And to that concern, I am sympathetic. The global versus local distinction is mythical in so many ways. And yet a line must be drawn somewhere in order to make governance manageable. Sure, Washington DC seems to make more sense and I will continue to direct my energy there, but they're not listening. And at this point, I am willing to pull any lever of power, even if there's just a small chance that combined with a thousand other tiny levers that will save the life of just one child and increase the possibility of a long-term peace. These days, I wonder if our spiritual work is the recognition of how little power we have, how incredibly small we are in the face of mil the military industrial complex of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-Arab bigotry. But the principled activists behind this resolution have convinced me that it is our moral obligation to try. And maybe if Washtenaw joins Ann Arbor and Detroit and Dearborn and Hamtramck, Dearborn Heights, Canton, Ypsilanti, Kalamazoo County, and Wayne County in calling for a ceasefire, then maybe Novi, Port Huron, Troy, Warren, and Sterling Heights will also join. And then maybe, just maybe, we will get the attention of those in the power in Washington. And we will have done our part to interrupt the war machine, to save lives and to pursue justice. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Herschel said, quote, in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. You, my friends, carry the great burden of public service. May you be blessed with the strength and courage. Thank you for all that you do, for the residents of Washtenaw County and for the world. May peace come soon. May we help make it so. Thank you. Thank you. Name, city, or township. My name is Ori. Uh, I live in Ann Arbor. I'm a proud member of the Ann Arbor Jewish community and a student at the University of Michigan. I urge this commission to support the resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. By endorsing such a resolution, you would be reaffirming this commission's commitment to humanitarian principles and the well being of all people affected by this conflict. As a Jewish member of this community, I must emphasize that this commission should reject the weaponization, distortion, and politicization of anti Semitism that is being used to suppress the voices of people who are advocating for the human rights and dignity of Palestinian people. In this room today, we see Jewish people standing in solidarity with Palestinians, Muslims, and Arab neighbors. A ceasefire resolution is not anti-Semitic. I believe this resolution would be a powerful step in helping bridge the racial, cultural, and religious divide that we see in this community today. Thousands of members within Washington County, including myself, continue to stand against the genocide occurring against the Palestinian people, against mass displacement, against military occupation, and against collective punishment. By introducing the resolution to call for a ceasefire in Gaza, you will be supporting the wants and needs of Jewish, Muslim, Palestinian, and Arab community members. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, come on down. Name, city, or township. Hello, my name is Catherine Slocum. I'm the Historic Preservation Specialist for Washtenaw County. I'm also a captain in the U.S. Army Reserves in the Historic Protection Unit. Um, I'm in favor of the ceasefire, and I also want to shift gears about a completely different resolution. Um, I will first want to note my support for the BOC. Thank you so much for your efforts to establish Wild Prey Farm in September as a new historic district, and I really appreciate that. We're going to have a new one coming up, so you're going to do that again <laughs> in a different township. Uh, but on our agenda tonight is also the Gordon Hall grant. And I want to note my support for that grant and also congratulate 
Dexter Area Historical Society, who has done immense work on preservation in Dexter, including you know, beyond Gordon Hall, also the work they do outside of that. Education programs for fourth graders, third graders, um, archeological studies for the university, preservation planning for EMU. They're a wonderful organization and have spearheaded this grant. And our job as the county is to support them in that effort and bolster their grant funding through our certified local government. So I hope that you guys approve that and we can hopefully have a meeting there at some point where we can have dinner and, and tea at their Gordon Hall events. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Did you say the city or township? I don't. I'm an employee. I'm not in Washtenaw County. I'm so sorry. Is that sufficient, Bryce? It is sufficient. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, name, city or township. I'm Carol Burke, and I live in Sio Township, just outside of Dexter. And I am here tonight following Catherine because um, we need this little space here just to think about uh, ongoing life um, here. I'm with the Dexter Area Historical Society, and I wanted to basically thank you folks for the work that you do to support our work at Gordon Hall and our work in, um, in historic preservation and historic education in general. Um, Gordon Hall is a wonderful place. If you haven't been there yet, you're invited anytime. Um, we are uh, working very hard to restore it to its original condition. Uh, we figure that between buying it and uh, restoring it, it's gonna take us about five and a half million dollars. We've spent a couple million of that, well, raised and spent a couple million of that already. And uh, grant funding is gonna be an important part of the remaining part of that work. Um, we've already received, I think, two different uh, certified local government grants um, in the past in cooperation with the county. And for that, we are very grateful. And I also want to call out tonight, in particular, uh, Commissioner Matieski, who helped make this possible this evening, and also uh, uh, Administrator Dill, who's supported us in the past, and also Commissioner Labar, who has supported us in the past. And there may be others of you who I haven't gotten to know quite as well, and I would like to. But um, we hope you will support it, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, come on down. Or if there's no one else in the room, I'm gonna to switch to online public house. Oh, nope, all right. Name, city or township. My name is Lauren Leslie, I'm in the city of Chelsea. I just wanted to um, urge you all to support the ceasefire resolution. Um, I think having been a member of the Chelsea community, it is a beautiful community of folks who since the murder of George Floyd in 2020 have had a commitment to their values against hate, against racism and uplifting peace in our community and all around. Um, I think that they are a representative of our liberation is intertwined in Chelsea, in Ann Arbor, in Washtenaw County, and across the world. And I think that if you, I know that all of you are here because you care about our communities, you care about our humanity, and I don't see any difference in the people who are here who are being represented, and our blood is no different from their blood. I urge you to support, to put your values forward, and to really support the humanity here and across the world. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next up for public comment, come on down. All right, name, city, or township? James Clark, uh, Jim Clark, Ypsilanti Township. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, I just wanted to, um, not to detract uh, from what's going on here right now, but uh, just a reminder that there's people outside freezing right now. Um, there's people sleeping in tents. We bring them propane when we can. Um, but currently there's um, uh, an eviction being prepared to, to be carried out um, over on Michigan Avenue. We're, we're scrambling to get these folks um, somewhere, um, but it's gotta stop. I mean, it's, it's minus six right now. You know, we need a ceasefire right here at home. You know, tell the cops to leave them alone, at least until the weather breaks for crying out loud, you know, or jump in somewhere and help us pay for these motel rooms. 
and like think about it. Go outside and sell your coat on for five minutes. That's what these people are experiencing right now. Washtenaw County does not need an exposure death. You understand? Okay. I mean, I mean, I I've, I've lived in this shit. It's no joke. I've I've laid down next to people who have died from exposure. I've laid down next to people who've kept me from dying from exposure. Hypothermia is a real thing. And right now, I mean, you're not going to last long out there. You know, we forget how easy it is to go from our car then to our garage and then to our house, not stopping to think that there's people sleeping in this outside. So please, for the love of God, you know, I'm asking you human to human, do something, something. 60 bucks a night at your motel saves a life. How much money do you got? You know what I'm saying? All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is G. I'm just going to keep it real short. Um, long story short, I was homeless myself this time last year. It's getting cold. Um, however, I've gotten myself off the streets with a lot of love and support. Um, however, I am spending a lot of time with going to camps, um, daytime warming centers. Um, the struggle is real, they're cold. Um, and a lot of the people that do the legwork are already doing so much for the community. I'm so burnt out. Um, we need more resources, we need help. Um, it's getting cold. Um, not only due to weather, but other circumstances like mental health resources, lost a lot of friends due to using and just, you know, the hardships of being homeless. Um, even I am still struggling uh, with the mentality, and yet I give so much to this community, but yet this community has not really given me much, I'm gonna be honest. Um, so we need your help. We need to be seen. We need to be heard. We need housing now. Thank you. I, I need a city or township for the record. It, it, Bryce got it. Bryce got it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. Come on down. Name, city or township. Cynthia Price, Ann Arbor. Um, I uh, wasn't planning to speak tonight, um, I, um, but I, I feel in just as uh, impassioned about it as the previous two speakers. Um, we work on these, these issues. Um, there, there are spaces, and I know that, that um, some of you are aware of them. Um, they're a court matter, actually, and, and you, know, you would not have jurisdiction over them. Um, one of them is a city matter, um, that's city of Ypsilanti that has jurisdiction. So, um, but the, what you do have jurisdiction over is getting a shelter, another shelter in, in um, Washtenaw County. It's, we, we need one. We, and, you know, I mean, I, I've been coming for several months and saying it's, it's coming, it's, they're gonna be freezing temperatures. And I mean, my God, I, you know, it, it, it's hard to even get gas. I mean, the, the past few nights, imagine sleeping out in it. I mean, I know people who are sleeping out in it. And, um, you know, we are trying our best. We're trying everything we can do to, to get hotels for these people ourselves, um, you know, either out of our own pockets or out of, out of um, the funds of, of small nonprofit or not even nonprofit, grassroots operations. But we we just we need the county. We need the county to step up. And I, you know, it, the time is is now. Um, the time was before, and now it's 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 incontrovertible um, that it needs to be done now. Something needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, come on down. Name, city, or township. Hello, my name is Cam. I'm from Ann Arbor. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that passing a ceasefire resolution is the barest to bare minimum. Uh, lawyers and legal experts around the world have stated that what Israel is doing is genocidal. 
By passing a ceasefire resolution, it shows the residents of Washtenaw County that their representatives care about their voice and understand what is going on in Gaza affects people here. Michigan had the largest population of Arab Americans in the United States. So for any Michiganders that think that this does not affect us, you're wrong. I wanna point out how extremely dystopian it is to have taxpayer money being given to a military killing innocent civilians. So on that note, I'm asking for Washtenaw County to divest its money going to the Israeli military and allocate it towards other issues that will benefit us, such as um, solving food insecurity and homeless. Homelessness. In 2018, Washtenaw County alone had 10.7% um, of the population experiencing food insecurity. 7.6 of children under the age of 18 experienced food insecurity. During the COVID pandemic, uh, 2,800 people were homeless and seeking shelter. Back in April, 2023, Washtenaw put 3. Point, um, 3 million to fighting homelessness and evictions. Think about how much more that could do for our community. We are all aware of what our, you know, what to put our money towards, not towards the destruction of lives, but the bettering of them. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down, name, city or township. My name is Fadwa, I live in Washtenaw County. Yeah, city or township? Oh, Ann Arbor. There you go. All right. Uh, so I am a resident of Ann Arbor, and I gra I'm a graduate of EMU. And I just want to tell you that in my many years of living here, that when we talk about politicians and how they represent our community, there has been a strong disconnect. And so today, what we are asking we are asking each and every one of you to recommit with all the values, all of the beliefs that you put forth and say that you stand with all of your people. So now I wanna ask everyone who wants to put forth and support a ceasefire resolution, can everyone please stand? Everyone that supports it. You will not be just supporting your Muslim community members. You will be st standing for your Palestinians, your Jewish, community members, you will be standing for every, or your LGBT community members, you will be standing for every single person and saying that today and every single for, day forward, you recommit to your residents who need this money far more than a genocidal country that does not represent what Washington County wants to put forward. We have so many things to recommit our time, our energy and funds, and I ask you today, to truly reflect on where we stand. And again, I urge every one of you to look forward of all of these faces and go forward every single day recommitting where you stand with us. As a Palestinian, I ask you to see me and every single children when we reject this resolution. I ask you, where do we stand today? Thank you. Thank you. All right, come on down, whoever's next in the room. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Josh Brown. I'm from Ann Arbor. I want to start by saying that I hope everybody um, stays safe and warm throughout this entire winter after hearing um, the past couple of speakers. I'm here tonight because there's a resolution before you. When you read this resolution, you might not understand or see how a resolution calling for a ceasefire could be divisive. But I am here on behalf of many residents and students of the University of Michigan to tell you that it is divisive, as evident by the amount of people here. The division that this resolution, that passing this resolution would cause and does call and, and causes comes at no benefit because this resolution calling for a ceasefire does not make a ceasefire a reality. And 
calling for a ceasefire in a local uh, uh, in Washtenaw County um, is not going to have an effect in Israel where uh, where it would need to have an effect for, for it to be made a reality. And so passing this resolution only causes division for absolutely no benefit. A lot of people here tonight have told you that this issue affects people here today, uh, affects people here in Washington, and that's why it's a local issue. And they are correct, it does affect people here. Passing this resolution creates more division for the people living here and cannot possibly do any benefit for the people in Palestine or in Israel. Because again, this resolution has no effect in Israel and will have no effect in Israel. Discussions about what the federal government should do should be had or should be presented to the federal government. And it has been presented to the federal government. In fact, many of the individuals here, I believe, uh, traveled to the White House uh, a few days ago to uh, protest. That is the proper way to advocate for your position to the people who can actually do something about it. So once again, in, in conclusion, the resolution before you can only create division for absolutely no benefit. So I ask that you please vote no on this resolution for the ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else in the room for public comment? Yes. All right. Name, city, or township. Uh, my name is Karthik Ganapati, and uh, I'm a resident of Ann Arbor. Uh, and I'm here to speak in favor of the resolution denouncing rising hate and discrimination in Washtenaw County and calling for a lasting bilateral ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure exactly what this uh, resolution will do. I do think that you should vote yes for it. But after voting yes for it, I do hope all of you go back, use whatever power you have to get, you know, call your party people. Then I'm, I mean, I, I'm assuming all of you are Democrats. And uh, make sure you tell uh, genocide Biden that what he's doing is completely unacceptable. Uh, apartheid needs to end. The occupation needs to end. And you don't end up in apartheid by uh, by talking nicely to the oppressor. You end apartheid by suffocating apartheid, which is precisely what Ansarallah was doing by uh, blockading ships that were going to Israel. And just today, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced that they have yet again designated Ansarallah as a terrorist organization, a designated foreign terrorist organization, uh, you know, which essentially only means that more and more people will die in Yemen as well. Uh, this is completely unacceptable, and all of you must vote first vote yes, which is, again, as everybody has said, the bare minimum to end the genocide, and actually do something that will definitely, definitely help end the genocide, which is to call the Democratic Party people, call Union people that you know, all, everybody, you know, and tell them that all of us are extremely angry that rather than ending the genocide, the White House is deciding to f continue funding the genocidal rogue apartheid state, Israel, which has almost certainly is almost certainly committing genocide now, as we will know in probably a few years when the ICJ case concludes. But, we, you know, I and yeah, this is just extremely frustrating to me. Uh, I'm actually from India. And one thing that we all learn in our history books is just how tax is collected was collected by the British uh, and uh, held by them to make the local Indian leadership do whatever they want. And that's precisely what's also happening in the West Bank. Uh, the Netanyahu government has still not given tax revenue that they've collected for the last couple of months. And Biden is not even able to get Netanyahu to give that to the, the Palestinian Authority. I mean, it's a completely failed administration that we have right now, and I hope that you guys do everything that's, that is possible. I mean, this is the only thing that matters, ending a genocide. And I don't think anything else, I mean, there are, of course, local issues like ending homelessness and stuff that matters as well. I agree, but really, like, doing everything, putting all your political power to end the genocide, I think is exceptionally important at this time. Thanks. Thank you.
All right. Name, city, or township. My name is Reem. I'm from Can- Canton, but I go to school in Ipsy, and I've worked in the area for two years. So first, I want to say we've had a lot of people come up here and talk about problems that they see in this county. And working in healthcare, specifically in a pharmacy, I can't tell you how many people come in and can't afford medicine. And I'm talking basic medicine and inhaler, basic things for diabetes, things that they need to live, things that they need to manage conditions. And instead of keeping the money here, taking care of residents here, instead of me having to turn people away and say, sorry, suffer through asthma, have it be five gazillion times worse than it needs to be, we're sending money to murdered innocent children elsewhere. And despite what may have been said before, I'm sure you all know your voice has power. I'm sure you know people aside from here. I'm sure you didn't get into this career to do nothing because you think it's worthless. Your voice matters, our voice matters. And I think that our money could be spent significantly better. And I also want to say, I don't think that people are understanding what the occupation is like day to day. I have friends that live there. I have friends that I grew up with with children there. Those kids are like my nieces and nephews. They're my heart, and I'm waiting every single day to get a call that they've been killed. And day to day, just to get from one city to another, they have to go to these checkpoints. The checkpoints have IDF soldiers who strip them, take them from their parents. I had a friend have her clothes thrown around for upwards of three hours. She wears the headscarf like me. Imagine being stripped in a cold, dark metal room surrounded by four strange men just to have to do it again to get back home, just to go to school, just to exist. That's very, very bare minimum of Palestinian existence. A ceasefire is nothing. It is the very, very start of an end to a very violent existence. That's all I have to say. I wasn't planning on speaking, but I really, really urge you guys to listen to what people are saying because you have things to worry about here. Your voice matters. and. We're we're humans. I don't understand how far the line has to be pushed for us to say, okay, maybe this is wrong. So please stand up, find your humanity, do something, say something, talk to your people. We're tired. We're tired of our friends dying. We're tired of our family dying. Do something. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room for public comment? Please, not all at once. Yeah. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, so I apologize if there's some breaks in my speech. But um, I am in favor of Ann Arbor signing the ceasefire. And I've heard from different people that, you know, signing ceasefire here in Ann Arbor won't do anything on a bigger scale. But I would like to disagree with that. We have been we have been seeing in the ongoing international court of justice that even small videos taken by like Palestinians or informational videos are being used in court to push change. And I think that even a small statement like this from one city somewhere in the US will still lead to bigger change. Change doesn't happen overnight. It happens through the collective effort of many people, even if they don't think anything is going to come of it. Because if we all just thought, you know, I'm just one person, what is this going to do? If we all thought that nothing would happen, we need to make the change, even if it doesn't seem like it'll work. Thank you. I need your name and city or township. Sorry. Um, Ypsilanti. I... I don't know the township. Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. But your, but your name is? Um, Hiba Khan. Thank you. All right. All right. There are some people over there. All right. Come on down. Name, city, or township? Hi. My name is Lana, and I live in Celine. Um, I, like many other people, I wasn't planning on talking tonight. Um, I was only planning on coming to show my support, but I do want to offer my perspective as a student on the University of Michigan campus. Um, I am for this resolution to pass a ceasefire. Like they mentioned, this resolution may not put a ceasefire into effect immediately. However, it does make a difference passing a ceasefire in Washtenaw County. It will make a difference for all the Palestinians in the US whose families are disappearing in a matter of hours. It will make a difference for the students on campus who are having to come to school 
and put in the hours and put in the work, knowing that their families are disappearing in a matter of hours. The things we're seeing from the inside of Gaza are horrifying. As a student on the campus, I don't see division on our campus. I see Jewish students, I see Muslim students, and I see students from various other communities coming together. On campus, I've seen people of different religious backgrounds and different ethnicities coming together to try to make a difference. Change starts in a small room like this one, even if it doesn't feel like we're making the biggest difference. This is where we start. Thank you. Thank you. Bayaus. Name, city, and township. City or township. Hi, hey, everyone. My name is Giselle Arriaga Barrios. Uh, I'm a resident at Ann Arbor. Um, and I have a mother who is a survivor of a genocide. Um, she lived through the Salvadorian War. It lasted for about 12 years, 75,000 people dead. And it's really heartbreaking to have to relive these counts through the eyes of the Palestinian people. I really appreciate you guys for being here so long and hearing all of our stories, but every story matters because every story is political. And although some people may think that this ceasefire resolution does not mean too much because it isn't, you're not the president, you're not the vice president, but you are our commissioners and you do represent us. And I leave you with this story called the starfish story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's the reason I became a social worker and it goes, that there is a child on the sea with starfishes washed all over the shore. The child's throwing a starfish one by one back into the ocean. An adult comes up to the child and says, what are you doing? The child goes, the starfish are dying. I have to help them. The adult then comes up to them and says, you couldn't possibly save every single one of them. It couldn't possibly matter. The child takes one of those starfish throws back to the ocean and he goes, it matters to that one. All of our stories matter. This ceasefire resolution matters. I know it's not a pivotal thing, but it's a start in the right direction. And I know that if my mother had had someone to speak up on behalf of her all those years ago, if she had at least one county, one city talking about El Salvador, talking about the fact that Israel was also involved in that war, the fact that the US was also involved in that war. I know it would have mattered to her now. So I just wanted to leave you guys with that one because it does matter to at least one. And if not, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Name, city, or township. My name is Dylan Cohen. I'm a resident of Ann Arbor. Um, First, I want to say how happy I am to be here. Um, usually when our government leaders, our academic leaders say that they've met with the Jewish community, what they really mean is they've met with one aspect of it, the Zionist aspect. Um, they platform Republicans like Ron Weiser, um, the ADL, the APAC, these big, big, big things. And often us anti-Zionist Jews are pushed by the wayside. We are the exception to Jewish exceptionalism. So I'm really, really happy to be here in a direct way where I can talk to all of you. You're right here, you can listen to me, you can listen to us. Secular Jews to rabbis across the country, across the world, in Israel, everywhere are speaking up and hardly people are listening to them. We're calling for a ceasefire. <laughs> There's a growing number of anti-Zionist Jews who want this. Um, and I know a lot of people think that this might be divisive or it won't have a direct impact. You know, it's not, if Washtenaw County passes a ceasefire resolution, of course, it's not gonna immediately end the violence. The massive death, massacre, the, the smell of death is still going to be lingering in the air in Gaza. People are still going to be arrested for no other reason other than, quote, administrative detention in the West Bank. Um, it, it won't but it's gonna start something. It's gonna get the ball rolling. Um, and like, we can be a part of it. We can be a part of like this, um, yeah, movement towards liberation in the West. We can pass that on to the East. Um, I really, really wanna see that happen. And I want to see Washington County's foreign policy reflect its domestic policy. Um, 
people are dying of exposure in Gaza. They're living in tents. <laughs> that might happen here. I really, really don't want to see that happen. I have so many houseless friends in Washington, in Ann Arbor. <laughs> my friend Tony, oh my, I'm like worried about him. Whenever I see him, I'm so worried. Um, in the West Bank, people have different license plates um, identifying their passport status, their, their citizenship status. Um, in America, un our undocumented friends and family don't have driver's license. I, I really want to help ask you guys to help um, get the drive safe bill in Michigan passed. Um, and if you want to save lives in Washna, you have so many opportunities to do so. And if you want to save lives in Palestine, you have the opportunity to do so tonight. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else in the room for public comment? All right, well, we will turn to our friends online. Ashley, who do we have online? Uh, yes, Chair. First up, we have Melissa Robinson. Melissa, please state your name and city or township. Hi, my name is Melissa Robinson. I'm a Lodi Township resident who has lived in Washtenaw County for 15 years. I am speaking to urge the Board of Commissioners to pass the ceasefire resolution on the agenda tonight. I would also like to say thank you to those speaking to the needs of our houseless community tonight. I'm a public health professional who has been devastated by the unfolding public health crisis in Gaza. Tens of thousands of Gazans have been killed by U.S. bombs dropped by Israel. Thousands more have been injured, lost limbs, lost parents, or perhaps they are now the only surviving member of their family. All of these people are more than numbers. They are as human as all of us here, virtually and physically. Survivors have been displaced. They are starving with little access to food, safe drinking water, and health care. This is an unimaginable public health crisis and an absolute nightmare that haunts me every day. A ceasefire is the necessary first step to minimize the loss of human life and trauma experienced by the people of Gaza. Please pass the ceasefire resolution and share with our federal representatives who have the power to make a difference. My daily calls to my federal representatives have done nothing to affect change, but perhaps our call as a county can shift the stance of our federal leaders. We must try. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ashley, who do we have next? Here next we have Samuel Hayes. Samuel, please state your name and city or township. Um, hello, my name is Samuel Hayes, and I live in Superior Township. I believe before I was saying Ypsilanti, but I'm like right near that little border, but I'm in Superior Township. Uh, first, I would like to say happy bladed MLK Day, and I would like to read a passage from the letters from Birmingham Jail. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Um, so happy belated MLK Day. Read the letters from Birmingham Jail. Amazing document. Um, I would like to also say thanks to the Board of Commissioners for all their hard work. Um, I see that Hawk is getting some full-time positions. I really appreciate, as a member of the labor organization, uh, the questions about how those positions were being filled, and I appreciate the responses that we were going to be following the collective bargaining agreement there. So thank you so much for that, commissioners, and um, also uh, Greg Dale, uh, county administrator. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to bring up, I've been kind of wandering around the county here a little bit and going to different township things. Um, a few months back, one of the commissioners had brought up, I cannot remember specifically which one, I'm sorry, that some of these other entities in Washtenaw County should maybe bear some type of responsibility or some of a, um, some of the weight of some of these services that are at contention here, like the, the shelter, mental health care services and everything. And um, I had went to the Ypsilanti City uh, Township uh, meetings and uh, or city council meetings and there were some talks of a homeless shelter discussed but i believe a lot of the residents um didn't really enjoy that idea and there were some other organizations over there working um to keep people housed and sheltered and warm and um, i would encourage the board of commissioners to maybe try to reach out to some of those entities maybe reach out to the city and see if there's something that maybe you could do to help that process along that would really do a lot to alleviate your own burden that you guys have on these things, uh, bandwidth wise and financially as well. 
Um, I was at Superior Township, and I believe a few months ago, there was a detox center proposed on some land that they owned. But again, the residents had a lot of opposition to that. Um, that might be something to reach out to the township, uh, Superior Township, and see if there's something you can do to help them with that. Um, I was also at the Ann Arbor City Council meetings, and they had sold a building to the housing authority. And I believe they had a commitment to affordability. Maybe that's something the Board of Commissioners can keep an eye on as well. Um, affordable housing is a must. And I would also like to encourage the Board of Commissioners to vote yes on this resolution regarding Gaza. And after voting yes to a very simple peace and bilateral ceasefire, um, afford a space for a further conversation to unravel this web of conflict that's been going on. And maybe we can make a lasting peace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley, who's next? Sorry about that. Next, we have Arya. All right. State your name, city, or township. Hi. Um, I'm Arya. I grew up in Ann Arbor and currently live and work here. I'm an anti-Zionist Jew, and I want to express my full support for the ceasefire. Ann Arbor has historically been a place where people have advocated for peace and an end to all war. Yet we see many people in this city claiming the attacks on Gaza are valid and repeating propaganda that falsely claims Israelis are justified in their actions. This thinly veiled racist rhetoric is spread in the name of Jews everywhere and uses our identities, history, and false claims of anti-Semitism as a tool of suppression. This is an anti-Semitic notion in and of itself. I urge Washtenaw County to denounce these racist and anti-Semitic rhetorics and to remind the people who live here of the peaceful qualities that people used to love about this city and county. It is only the first step in changing the framework of Michigan's engagement with this genocidal apartheid state, but it is a dire action in the face of a horrendous number of civilian casualties, which has now exceeded the amount killed in all wars in the 20th century. Citizens have little control over how our tax dollars are spent. We have no option other than making as much noise as possible and begging our representatives to listen to us. Seeing how many people have come here before you to ask for this motion, our commissioners shouldn't even have a choice but to be the echo of our pleas. The money that goes towards Israel could be used by the people who are expressing a need for housing, health care, etc. today. It's insane that the money that we pay for our services are going towards genocide when people are dying here in extremely preventable ways. Listen to your constituents and end the, the violence. You have the power. Thank you. Do we have anybody else online? Yes, Chair. Uh, next, we have Abby Allman. All right, state your name and city or township. Hello, Board of Commissioners. My name is Abby Allman. I live in Ypsilanti Township, um, and I just wanted to echo the supports of a voting um, for a bilateral ceasefire in Gaza. Um, I wanted to, you know, echo some of my comrades who have already spoken already. Um, thank you for showing up and um, speaking. Um, I have spoken in front of this board several times um, as a Washtenaw County employee. I work for Community Mental Health and I am an active member of our union. Um, I wanted to speak briefly about the notion that this um, affects our community, which um, you know I wholeheartedly believe that it does, but I just wanted to give voice to the fact that it has a direct um, consequence and um, a direct line to the communities that specifically Washtenaw County services serve, right? Um, our, you know, on the community mental health side and, you know, with other many community services, we um, help the most vulnerable people in our community, which includes houseless folks, um, folks with severe mental illness, folks who need a lot of community support, um, however that may look. And um, uh, not only is the ceasefire an important, uh, you know, tool, a community tool, um, to show solidarity with the people of Palestine, um, it will have a direct uh, correlation and support, support and ripple effect within uh, the community members that we serve. I have seen it myself. Um, I think this would be a profound tool in showing our community um, 
that they stand with them because as so many people have already echoed, um, our federal government um, has proven time and time again to side um, with the oppressors and continue to enact uh, horrific, you know, uh, state violence beyond many Americans comprehension. So once again, I support a guy bilateral ceasefire in Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else online? Yes, Chair. Uh, next we have Sarah E. All right, Sarah, state your name and city or township. Hi, my name is Sarah Emirates. I'm from Ypsilanti, Michigan. I I'm so grateful for how many people have already spoken, um, similar to many other voices. I am here definitely to support the ceasefire. Um, I think at any level, whether it's individual in conversations in our cities, in our counties, in our states, et cetera, like we need to be really advocating for this, especially because as taxpayers, our money does go directly to these bombs, to the devastation, to the literal genocide and slaughter of people. Um, calling for a ceasefire, whether or not Washtenaw County specifically calling for it leads to it. I think there's no harm that comes from acknowledging that the slaughter of children with bombs, munitions, white phosphorus, and a countless range of other uh, war crimes that we're funding and enabling um, is really devastating. Is um, Yeah, ultimately, it's something that I think we should all be really advocating for. Um, also, to the point of being taxpayers in just the cities of Chelsea, Celine, Milan, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, um, and Dexter, we give $2,504,916 roughly of our money to um, militarizing Israel when exactly as other members have said already, there's a really desperate need for houselessness services. And this isn't new. Michigan is known for being cold. Um, while last year was not as bad, this year is already brutal and it, it is literally deadly. There are so many services that don't exist and cannot exist because the funding and resources, the focus and energy and efforts are not there. And I think it's a really, really pivotal step for us to invest in recognizing the public health issue, the mental health issue, the collective communal issue that is the racism fueling genocides, fueling, um, again, like a divestment from housing and human services, from food security and access and so many other things. So uh, yeah, again, I, I'm really grateful for folks that have shared much more eloquent statements than I have and really hope that we can both invest in our own communities and take more steps to divest from the genocide that we're currently funding. Thanks. Thank you. Who else do we have online? Uh, next, we have Mackenzie. Mackenzie, please state your name and city or township. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Robinson, um, and I live in Lodi Township, and I work in the city of Ann Arbor. Um, I just want to uh, con um, also urge the Board of Commissioners to vote yes to pass the ceasefire resolution on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Great to the point. All right, uh, anybody else online? All right, last call for any other public comment in the room. Anybody else that was here early? Come on down. Please state your name, city, or township. Hi, uh, my name is Tess Crowster. I live in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, I didn't have time to prepare anything, so I'll keep this brief. Um, I, I want to talk about two things. One, uh, the ceasefire resolution, which I urge you all to pass. Um, as many others have said, the tax money that we're spending on that um, horrific war could be used for services that are desperately needed. And moreover, um, as human beings, it is our duty to stand up against crimes against humanity in any way that we can. And this is one way we can do that. Um, speaking of desperately needed services, um, we need shelter for unhoused individuals. Um, we need an end to sweeps. There have been a number of sweeps, a couple at least, in the past couple weeks of camps um, and um, the money, the emergency funding that was passed uh, in November, still the disbursement of it is seeming to be lost in the administration. I mean, I know it's in the works, but really we just need it to happen as fast as possible. These are extremely dangerous conditions and people need that. 
emergency assistance now. They need it immediately, really. So I just wanna urge you all to urge the rest of the administration who has the power to make that money move to do that. Um, yeah, ceasefire now, free Palestine. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? No, all right, well, we are gonna move on to commissioner response to public participation. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, Commissioner Labar was quickest on the draw this time. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'll try and set a precedent of, of brevity here in response, but I uh, certainly appreciate the time that folks have given uh, tonight. Um, I, my chief concern in bringing any issue like this up is when a pandemic hits and you need a public health service or when you're in a mental health crisis, those are functions of county government that are life and death in some circumstances. And I wanna make sure we never knowingly do something as a unit of government that builds uh, distrust or exacerbates existing distrust. Um, and so I've heard a few times tonight about the question of relevancy. I'd, I'd say this Gaza resolution is most certainly from a human standpoint, very important. Uh, from a technical standpoint of it, is it legally germane to the county's uh, function? No, and that's based on precedent and based on state law and so forth, and we've, we've covered that. But I do think you have brought it uh, via two members of our board who've worked principally on it, and you've come to the table in the right fashion. You followed the board rules, um, and, and, and so I think we owe you a vote. Uh, I, I, I will, with a lot of deliberation and concern vote for it. Um, the substance of it at the end of the day, yes, I, I want a ceasing of violence. I think everybody wants that. My concern is this. I've heard a few speakers tonight, and I think we would all say that the majority spoke in favor of the resolution. I've heard a few speakers who have indicated that they had thoughts on how we should shape the use of the words uh, prim primarily anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish, anti-Jewish. Uh, um, the problem is not the shaping of those words. The, the, the problem is I have heard directly from people who I represent and who I have great affection for and who I care about that they have said, that is how I feel. I feel excluded. I feel, and the words that were used yesterday to me were erasure and exclusion. And so I say all this just because my vote is one for what I think at the end of the day, if I was going to be judged looking in the mirror, what would I want that judgment to say? Yes, I want I want peace. I do want a ceasing. Um, but I have concerns when we pass this, and I do think it'll pass. How do we build back those bridges and how when those individuals or people they need and love need county services, what is the trust deficit that we have to repay there? And, and rebuild. And I'll wrap my conclusion up by saying, I don't have a good ending to these remarks. The truth is this will cause in some instances, uh, relationships to change and that distrust, I fear not able to be rebuilt in some circumstances. Uh, I balance this as best I can. I'll put out a statement later for anybody. I know generally this audience is like 10 times larger than what we normally have. Um, but I appreciate the, the work that folks have put into it and I appreciate the, uh, sensitivity. I know my colleagues have, have shown, uh, and I would, I would join anyone who seeks, uh, peace, uh, and, and connectivity in this community. Thank you, chair. Thank you, commissioner Barr. Anybody else? Commissioner Somerville, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to respond to some of the public comment regarding the issues with um, tent evictions and sweeps. Um, I know I spoke to a few folks out in the hallway briefly um, after they gave public comment. Um, and I know that I've had conversations with um, Administrator Dill and his team throughout the last two weeks. Um, we do have resources that we can use immediately to help um, get folks into emergency hoteling. Um, I do know that there are some situations where folks have animals, and I've talked to Administrator Dill about ways that we can potentially partner with the Humane Society to help figure out how to get people 
into hotels and, and safely um, house their animals um, when they can't take them. So I'm just sharing that here for folks who might not be here and who will watch later that we do have resources. Um, the county administrator has been um, available um, to help expedite those as immediately, um, especially while we're waiting for some of the rapid rehousing dollars to um, get out, but those will be fully out the door by the end of this month for some of our providing organizations. Um, but if, if folks do know people who need immediate shelter and a congregate setting is not an option for them, um, we are ready. Um, I feel okay. I don't know where Greg is at right now. Oh, he's right there. But I feel confident saying that because of what my conversations that I've had with him and, and comments that he said both in, in this room and in private meetings. So I'm just sharing that folks should reach out directly. I mean, if I'm not your commissioner, there are nine of us here um, and we are the pathway through to administration. He has the authority to get those dollars out immediately, especially in emergency situations. And I know that we're about to get some more bad weather this weekend. So please spread the word about that. Um, and I've also spoken um, two of the situations that have been mentioned tonight regarding tents are in my district. Um, one of them is due to a court order, which is not really something that we as county government um, officials can really intervene with, but I have spoken to um, the sheriff's office about the situation. And while they did, um, per the court order, have to put down a piece of paper that says what has happened per the court, um, they, they are committed to not forcibly removing people until there is an alternative option. Um, I'm just sharing that as a way to communicate it out. And if that's not true, please contact me. Um, I'm happy to have further conversations about that, but I've spoken to um, their office um, quite frequently over the last week about this, and they are not they are not interested in forcibly removing people without alternatives. So I know that there are individual circumstances in which people have pets or other needs, and we're ready to try to accommodate all of those. Um, and then the other... Um, it, the issue that most people spoke about tonight is with respect to the, the resolution calling for um, to stand up against hate in our community and to call for a bilateral ceasefire, a release of all hostages, um, and um, immediate humanitarian aid. Um, I appreciate everybody who spoke um, on this resolution tonight. I and the people who emailed us beforehand, and I'm sure who will email us afterwards. Um, I, this wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible, um, quite frankly, if, if Chair Hodge hadn't been willing to put it on the agenda. Um, so I just want to lift him up and say that um, I really appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the support from Commissioner Robbie um, and, um, and the members of the community who we've spoken to, um, especially want to thank some of the Ann Arbor City Council members who did a lot of the work over the last several weeks. Um, we took a lot of the language directly from the Ann Arbor resolution. And so um, I just want to say that here um, and, and make sure that the, they get credit for the work that they did. Um, Aisha Ghazi Edwin, um, Erica Briggs, Lynn Song, um, among others were having many conversations and listening to folks um, before um, Commissioner Robbie and Chair Hodge and I were interested in bringing this forward. Um, and so I just want to thank them for that. And I also want to thank members of the community, um, Palestinian members of the community and Jewish members of the community, um, all who have different perspectives on, on the way to, to put words on um, into a resolution. And we've made changes um, to help accommodate um, different concerns um, from different perspectives. Um, not just, there's not just two sides to this resolution. There are many. Um, and I, I I know that, um, and I watched some of the comments when Ann Arbor passed this, and I know that similarly, there are people who for different reasons are feeling a lot of pain. Um, and I just wanna uplift that this is a painful thing to talk about. Um, it's, it's painful when you hear people say things that you disagree with and you have to hold your composure in a room. But I think that um, it, I felt like everybody was very respectful tonight in this room um, and I appreciate that. It's, it's hard to do sometimes, but I did feel like everybody here had the ability to say what they wanted to say without the fear of being talked over or intimidated. And so that, um, I just think that means a lot. And I do think that 
um, what this resolution for me is about. It's about peace, um, not just in Israel and um, in in Gaza. It's it's about peace here too, and that's also part of the reason why. Um, I started speaking to other commissioners about the need to bring this forward and have a conversation here. Um, I know that people do think that this is not an issue for county commissioners to be discussing. Um, but from my perspective and the perspective of other people who I've talked to, it becomes a county issue when members of our own community are impacted. And this impacts mental health, which is something that, that we oversee as a county. Um, and I know that because we have so much access to information, there are kids seeing things for the first time in their lives that are really devastating and they're looking for adults to say something to make sense of it. And I think um, bringing forward a resolution about peace and reflecting that everybody in our community is valued and should be able to live a dignified life and not be harassed or targeted online um, is an important part of the conversation even if we don't have control over the disbursement of federal tax dollars or control over decisions that the commander in chief makes here in the United States or his um, relationship with um, another government and decisions that they're making. Um, but it does come back to, I think, issues that we deal with because as county commissioners, we know the great need for more tax dollars from the federal government to help improve programs for people in our own communities, whether it's housing or mental health. I mean, we often talk here about the need to pay direct care workers more. We, if we got more money from the federal government to provide those services, we would have um, more people living dignified lives in, in our own community. Um, so I do think that it might not seem like this issue is an issue of county commissioners to discuss. Um, but for a lot of reasons it is. And, and even just the, the humanity side of it, people really do feel unheard right now. Um, and I do also acknowledge that after, if, if this passes, that there are gonna be people who are upset that it passes. And so I want to acknowledge that. But I do also want to acknowledge that um, saying that like a statement about something like this is not a statement that county sh commissioners should be making or discussing at this table it kind of undermines democracy. Um, and I think as we go into, again, every election, every two years, it's the most important election of our life. Um, I really think that people need something to believe in, even if it's symbolic, and even if it's just sending a message to our congressional members, because we serve in a local capacity and because we're closer to constituents than folks higher up in different levels of government, we know the voices of our community and we understand better some of the issues and concerns and pain. Um, and so this resolution is, is about peace. It's about solidarity. It's about humanity. Um, and all of those things to me um, give people more hope. Um, and, and I do wanna say um, that for folks who, did speak out and say that this resolution is, is going to hurt them and harm them. Um, I do want us to take some time to think about why they were saying that and foster some conversations because I think that is super valuable. And if there are students on campus who think differently than we do, I think we can have conversations about that around peace um, because that's what this is about. So um, I just wanna thank Chair Hodge again and Commissioner Robbie, and I urge my um, fellow commissioners to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Somerville. Commissioner Beeman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I also want to express my appreciation for everyone who has come forward this evening with your views on the ceasefire resolution. It's not easy to address an elected body like ours. And so I truly appreciate and thank you for your strength and determination. I've been aware of the conflicts in Israel for some length of time. For eight years, my students participate in a program that travels to Israel. We share it with the university in Israel. There were many years we could not travel because of conflict. There were students who came to me that were afraid to travel because of their identity or their ethnicity. 
I've had multiple views of the ongoing issues in this area for nearly a decade because of my work. Because of my role outside of Washtenaw County, I feel I must abstain from this vote. For those of you that don't understand, uh, we are not full-time employees of Washtenaw County. We uh, either have other roles to support our families. Uh, we've had those who have been retired in the past. As many commissioners have done before me, it is simply a conflict with the role that I have outside of the county. I do put my faith in my fellow commissioners to bring forward the decision of the board. I'm supportive of peace everywhere around the globe. I'm supportive of humanitarian aid. To all who walk this earth in areas of terror and oppression and disparity, I'm a mother and I cannot imagine the terrors that are happening in Gaza, Ukraine, and other areas within the world. So thank you, um, and I will be abstaining from this ceasefire vote. Anybody else? Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Rachel Goldberg, who is the mother of Hirsch Goldberg Poland, an American who's held in hostage in Gaza, asked people this week to wear a small piece of tape with the number 100 written on it on January 14th, which was the number of days her son has been held in cap captivity. I'm wearing that tape tonight, um, 103 days, uh, the days he's been held. And it's also close to the number of days this conflict has been going on. I listened to Rachel Goldberg on the New York Times podcast, The Daily Days After Her Son Was Taken, and I was in absolute tears, prostrate, um, that her beautiful son, not that much older than mine, gone, but so close to where she was, but so far, so just out of reach from where she was. Ooh. Just as I was in tears later listening to stories about hospitals in Gaza losing power, having no more medication. I am, uh, as my colleagues know, and some of you know, my we all have these day jobs, an ICU nurse, and I know how I feel when I'm short-staffed in my hospital, and I can't even imagine how these nurses were feeling, because you know those nurses were going to work every day and how they felt trying to take care of people with no power or no medication. Ooh, I'm gonna try not to cry now, but I just wanna be clear right now that there are horrific conflicts happening globally. There are Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps in China. Also another patient I had talking to me about, they haven't been able to talk to their family in years because of this. There's civil war in Myanmar. There is this confrontation in Taiwan. Are you paying attention to that? This confrontation in Taiwan with China looming over them with barely any countries globally recognizing Taiwan as a country. There's instability in Haiti, right, right very close to us, this instability in Haiti. There are people in the world who are being killed for being gay like me, or being sent to prison, or mental institutions, or hung, like gay men are hung in Iran, or just existing being gay as a crime in Uganda. How about the women who are in Iran who are being jailed and rejailed again and again for their right to unveil in public, their right to ride a bike, the right to dance or sing in public, or Syria, who uses sarin gas on their own people, or Qatar, where modern day slavery is a fact of life. Why don't we have resolutions about those things at this table? The people that are being killed because they're gay, that impacts me, that impacts my mental health. That tells me where I can go in the world and where I can't, where I'm safe. We don't have resolutions like that at this table. Is it because we don't care about Uyghur Muslims or gay people or women? 
yeah, by God, we do care. We, I care. I don't comment on those global things at this table or bring resolutions to this table because I don't see that it's germane to the policy discussion I have here. Of course I want a ceasefire. Of course I really would like to see a different leadership in Israel. Of course I'd like to have any sliver of military funding that goes to, that we have taken in this country. I don't make the policy about where the tax money on our federal level goes. And believe me, you can ask my mom and dad, I've been pissed about that since my first job when I was 15, asking if I could withhold my tax payments. My mom was like, Katie Scott, you will go to jail. No. Uh, but I wanna see this same passion. And to be fair, I have seen some of it from our community about food and security here, about kids who are going to school hungry and school's the only place where they're guaranteed food, about people sleeping outside in their cars, or as my friend Jim pointed out, as my friend Jim pointed out, they're doing tonight. They did last night and they'll be doing tomorrow night. But the fact of the matter is right now, the resolution's at our table. I wish we'd had a resolution that said, we're one community with backgrounds we can all be proud of, Arab, Israeli, French, German, Chinese, Irish, whatever, whatever it is, and that we're going to work together as a county to further understanding with each other, despite what's happening in Israel, Gaza, China, Ukraine, Russia, Iran, Haiti, Sudan. That's not the resolution we have. I do want to thank my colleagues for working with the multitude of community members, including some language I specifically asked for regarding anti-Israeli sentiment. I could have answered anti-Sephardic, anti-Mizrahi, more. And just as a point, I want to remind you that 53% of Israel's Jewish community are Jews expelled from Arab countries, like my uncle Sammy and his family who were expelled from Egypt in 1968. I want to thank this room also for their respectful comments, and it shows, I believe, the very heart of our community. I'm hopeful that dialogue can help grow peace, and if that's the impact of the, this resolution, I can accept that. To those of you who are in this room who talked about you don't know if you can vote again for the current occupant of the White House, please think long and hard about the alternative a man who has said he would not mind being a dictator, who has flaunted the Constitution of the United States. So you might think this is your die on the hill issue, but you might also think about the very foundation of democracy. Ask me what I can do from this table. I can try to help people sleeping in their cars, in tents, in going to school hungry, and not being able to pay their bills. We could take up all of our time at this table on global issues, but by God, don't we have enough issues here in this county that we can actually impact change on. I don't want anyone to die needlessly in Palestine, in Gaza, in Israel, or here, where I can hopefully make a change so that we don't have someone dying of exposure. Thank you. I'm eager to move forward with the county's business. Thank you. Anybody else for a response to public comment? See you. Oh, Mr. Sanders. I'm going to take a minute to just read something that I posted um, October 13th um, on my commissioner uh, social media page. My heart is heavy over the war in Israel. I have friends who have family in Israel and Gaza. Terroristic murder is not an acceptable way to settle disagreements or feuds. I am praying for the innocent children and adults who were needlessly killed by actions that have triggered a war. Praying for peace, love, and healing. I also want to lift up, because I still haven't decided yet. I probably won't be deciding up until you call my name for the vote. Um, that the first three paragraphs um, of this resolution are words that I could support. The rest is not that I don't support it, but I don't understand lifting up. I mean, either we're lifting up this issue or, you know, kind of adding in a little fluff is 
you know, when, when there's talk about um, supporting the sheriff's department um, and the prosecutor's office in some of their um, promises to the community, that's when I kind of have to fall in line with Commissioner Scott and say, when have we done this for anyone else? We did not bring a resolution to support Ukraine. I've never seen a resolution in my time. And if I don't remember, sue me because I'm part-time. Um, resolutions about African-Americans that are every day, every single day um, under attack. Every day that they walk out of their house every day that I walk out of my house with this new hairstyle that is not European and people say meaningfully fully that, oh, we love your hairstyle, but that's, that's too two-sided. It's, man, you got the nerve to walk out of the house wearing that hairstyle. And then there are those that actually do support it. I want to say to our American Palestinians, our American Jewish people, that I do not support any type of, and I call it terroristic murder because that's what it is. I would stand up and support, I do stand up and support. I support all of our Washtenaw County residents and I show up everywhere, not just in my own district. And I've been doing it before I was elected. I will continue to do it. I don't want to say that this is a campaign election year sort of thing, but I, I do want to ask out loud. I mean, I actually attended the city of Ypsilanti meeting that went until 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m. I didn't leave after public comment. I stayed until the end. And I went for a number of reasons. I went to support Mayor Brown because she is like family to me and she was under attack for something that she did not do. I have said before, I don't appreciate ambush work. When you bring a resolution to the floor without being fair enough to your colleagues to let them know what you're doing, knowing that you're about to hoodwink them. I showed up to support her and I showed up because I wanted to hear what was going on. I appreciate every last one of you that has come out today. And has come out concerned for your safety. Will leave here concerned for your safety. I know what that is. All of us around this table show up to do the work for you. And we are often not appreciated. And I don't want to take away the message of why you're here. That's not why I'm speaking. But if we're going to stand up, we need to stand up for everybody. Everybody. And as an African American, I didn't ask to come here. I didn't have a choice, but I've had to learn and I am still learning every day how to deal with, tolerate, navigate people that don't want to give me an opportunity to do the right thing. And I do it anyway, because I don't answer to anybody walking on two legs. I am straight no chaser. I'm not going to sell my soul to get reelected. But we need to take care of everybody, not just special interests. And I'm not saying that you are, so please don't walk away misquoting me. But as someone that has raised a child by herself, where you have to prepare, what if I get in an accident? What if I can't get to my child to pick them up for daycare? And now to have a grandson, 
that needs a little bit more help and having to fight systems to take care of him. We as a county just need to learn how to be more kind. We need to be honest with ourselves about our shortcomings. When we talk about the housing and the homelessness, I don't even think I can be honest sometimes because people are going to attack you. They don't even seek to understand first. They don't ask any questions. I have not had one constituent reach out to me and say, I demand that you do this. No one has asked me to do a resolution. I've gotten many emails in the last, what, five days? That's because word got out that someone was doing it. But neither the Arab American community nor the Jewish community has reached out to me as a county commissioner and said, can I talk to you? And I have tried to ask for some insight to better understand this war. No one has been responsive to me. And I've asked more than once because I want to understand it. I don't want to just veto something that I don't, I don't really get the whole picture of. So I, I need to be clear that I don't support either side in terms of the things that they're doing that are contrary to living. And I cannot imagine what it would be like if my daughter were studying abroad over there and all of this happened, not to be able to get to her or not to have a State Department that was going to make sure that they were doing what they needed to do in order to get that U.S. citizen back here. This is bigger than the county commission. But I have to go to my real job tomorrow and work with my friends and my employers who are on both sides. And I'm trying to decide if I'm going to utilize the abstain option because I didn't even know that was an option, Commissioner Beeman. Thank you. But I want you to know that I support you as human beings, your loved ones, your friends, your families that are in this hot mess. I just hope that we're going to do more than just put some words on paper. I hope that the next time we see someone that is out struggling on the street, we're not just at the board table talking about it. We actually pick up the phone and say, I need you to take care of that. I do that on a regular basis, probably to the chagrin of our staff. But I just, I had to, I just had to have some words with you because I don't want anybody putting any words into my mouth. I don't need them to do that. If you want to know what I think, just ask me. I am available. I keep saying that. Email, phone number. I can't pay people to reach out. But I think moving forward, all of our Washington County residents need to know that we are elected by you. And I personally would prefer to hear from you before there is some sort of emergency or tragedy. So I have an idea of what it is that you need. So again, I wanna thank all of you for coming out. It's your fault that I cry at the board table. I try not to do that, but I do recognize the strength and the courage that it took to come out and say your name and say where you live and give your heartfelt feelings because it's easier to hide and to throw your rock and hide your hand. So I just want to say thank you to all of you, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. And if you got issues with how I decide to vote when they call my name, as long as you're not coming at me with daggers, we can talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Light, go ahead. 
Um, I would just like to thank everyone for coming to speak. And I want you to know that you are heard. Uh, I'm not just listening, you are heard. As my daughter says every day, I hear you, I see you, I got you. Um, this is difficult uh, for us to, my job for myself, my duty to serve you is to protect you in this county, to make sure that you are safe. And it's not that I don't wanna pass the resolution, but I am here to protect all, to serve all, because you all believe that I would do that for you. And so I don't stand on either side. I am here, as I said, to serve, to protect, and to make sure that you are safe and that you receive every service. Whatever it is that you need, that's what I am here for. That is my duty. And it, 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 this is a, it's very hard to, to pass the resolution only because it's saying that I'm picking a side, but I'm here and I stand for every one of you individually, like I said, and I got you all. And so I'm struggling because this is your life. This is, we are here to protect you and I wanna do that. And I wanna make sure that we do that. Um, but I don't want anyone to feel that we're not doing so by passing a resolution that is going to take size or that may call, cause division or that may bring about things here internally in Washtenaw County that, that brings about violence because I stand against it anywhere in this county, in this state, in this country. I don't condone it, but as I said, I'm here to protect you. I, I know that we have to have, we have to talk about these things. We have to bring resolutions forth, but I just wanna be clear that I'm here to protect and to serve and I'm not picking a side. I can't. Before I became a commissioner, I worked in social services and my duty and my job was to serve. And I did that every single day to make sure that those that needed services in this county, that they received it no matter what side of the county, no matter your religion, no matter your belief, I had to do that. And that's what I'm still here to do. And so this is a struggle because I just wanna protect and serve and make sure all are safe without picking a side. Commissioner Machieski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I first want to uh, recognize Carol Burke uh, from Dexter Historical Society for all of her work. Um, not only on the, on the, the item that's before us tonight for Dexter, but um, for all of her work you know, in the community. Uh, it's, it makes uh, quite a difference in the Dexter community. And I, I hope that uh, if, if uh, her work and the work of the Dexter Historical Society interests you, that you take uh, a little bit of time and go visit Gordon Hall. Uh, it's a pretty amazing and important story to be told there. Uh, so thank you, Carol, for being here tonight. Uh, I want to thank all of you as well for, um, again, the courage to come up and, and offer public comment. It's not an easy thing to do, whether it's in person, especially, or um, by calling in uh, remotely. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I, too, through my day job, I work in Wayne County in a human services agency. And I work with the Arab American community in Dearborn and Dearborn Heights through Access. I work with the Jewish community through Jewish Family Services and other organizations. Um, and I too have heard both sides of this argument on a daily basis. Um, I, you know, October 7th was um, a horrific day in Israel. And there have been horrific incidents in the 103 days since then in Gaza. And I wanna thank Commissioner Scott for reading off the list of other horrific events that are going on across the world that we are not addressing through resolutions. Um, saves me the time from reading that list as well. Um, I don't know how I'm gonna vote when this comes up later tonight, um, but what I do know is I, I hope that those who have influence in actually implementing a ceasefire can get to that point because for me it is 
you know, if that can happen for me, maybe that's an opportunity for, for humanity to come through. And for us, for everyone to remember that the people on the other side of an argument or an issue or a war or a conflict, they have fear and they have hope and they have dreams as well. Uh, and maybe that uh, through a ceasefire, that's the ultimate road to, to peace. I, um, I remember being a freshman at the University of Michigan in Dearborn uh, in a speech class. And we were, we had to do a speech at the end of the term. We got to pick the topic. And the topic I picked was there needs to be a two-state solution in the Middle East. That was 19, spring of 1988. Um, you know, my entire adult life and professional life, his, this issue has been front and center. Is it? political science student. Um, you know, this was a, an important topic for me. Um, it's rather sad to see this is the, this is the state that, that we are in, is humanity living this today. Um, again, I don't know what I'm going to do uh, when it comes for a vote. Um, but much like has been said earlier, um, you know, when I look back on this particular moment and this particular vote, and I look look myself in the mirror, I wanna, I wanna be on the side of humanity and doing what's right, um, as we do. I think with just about everything we do at this table. Um, so, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and, and the very thoughtful and impactful comments of everybody at this table. Uh, it's, uh, greatly appreciated on such a heavy topic. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anybody else for response? Uh, Commissioner Robbie. Um, I'll keep my comments brief, which is usually not characteristic of me, but uh, I know that this is not going to be actually voted on until later in our agenda, so I will have more to say later. But <clears throat> what I wanted to start with is just a thank you to everybody that came out tonight to um, you know, express your position on this. Uh, it was particularly... Um, reflecting on the comments uh, that uh, the individual made speaking about the starfish and speaking about the every story, right, in this. And it's every story, frankly, on, on both sides, people bringing different stories forward about their experiences during this catastrophic time for our planet. Um, and I wanna uplift and recognize all of those stories and the fact that we are, often not coming to the mic in any other capacity than to speak from how we are experiencing this moment. And it's often fear, feeling of discrimination, feeling of that the community is not unified. And I think that is something we heard time and time again. And I, and I hope that we can heal from this moment uh, we need to heal from this moment as a community. I just want to briefly say how how this resolution impacts me and how how I'm feeling right now because I think that's another story, another starfish perhaps. But you know, I came of age during the time right after September 11th, and with a name like Yusef, um, it was not an easy time, and to experience living in a community where community members were frankly disappearing, deportations, businesses, windows were being broken. Um, and I, at times, many times during that, did not sense and connect I didn't feel like my community saw me as, as human every day. And after what transpired in Israel on October 7th, my immediate thought was a reflection on the deep pain of the individuals who uh, were killed and on <clears throat> all Israelis and Jews across the world. And I, and I really felt that that 
what what they experienced was unprecedented, and I felt pain for them. Um, and then in the days that followed, I felt that my life started to feel again the way that I felt after September 11th because the language that was being used to describe people who look like me, people whose names are the same as mine, was the same language used to describe animals. And that made me feel, again, like I had lost a little bit of my humanity. And um, I think what the bottom line of what I want to say is in the months that have followed, watching the treatment of my fellow humans and people who's, again, who's, who's, who have the same names as me, I see little Yusufs getting killed, starving. And I think to myself, how cruel is this world that has seen the death of innocent Israelis and the death of innocent Palestinians and a world in which we can all somehow look at each other as less human. And um, I, I know that not everybody agrees with this resolution and that it's, and I wanna tell my colleagues too, who have already spoken about the difficulty of this resolution for them, this, I, I hear you and I see you and I understand what you're saying. It, it makes sense. This is not an easy thing to do. But what I wanna say from my perspective is that what, what this resolution says to me is that I am human and that suffering and death is not okay no matter who the people are that are suffering and dying. And, and really that's what I wanted to say here is, is how I've been feeling throughout this whole process and, and why this is an important resolution to me. I think it's fair and balanced. It's language that has been vetted. It's not language that would have been, you know, the ideal language of, of anybody, but it's language that was vetted through a, a process of discussion and negotiation. And, you know, there's even some ways that we can make this stronger tonight. But um, I, I wanted to just say those words to express just how I've been feeling through this whole process. Um, and I think that there's a lot of similar feelings that people have uh, that are Jewish and Israeli, that are Palestinian, Arab, Middle Eastern, North African. Um, and at the end of the day, the last comment that I want to make is, you know, I, I pray for a day when we realize that all people, especially those of us who come from the Middle East, North Africa, whether we are Arab or Israeli or Jewish or Muslim, I'm Berber, whatever our ethnicity is, that we start to see each other as equally human. And that we have bigger problems that we can solve when we work together rather than when we are divided amongst each other. So I, I hope that we can pass this resolution and not step into a place of further division, but step into a place of beginning to seek unity in our community and in the world. Thank you. Everyone has responded at this point. Would anybody like to respond again? Before I say a couple of things. All right, okay, I would say I wanna thank everyone for coming out uh, for public comment for all of the, the topics that were discussed. Uh, this is, it's always challenging to address as it's been mentioned a public body, particularly on a issue that is so emotionally charged uh, and very clearly it's emotionally charged on the dais as well. Uh, I wanna thank commissioners Somerville and Robbie for the significant time that they put into development of the resolution. Uh, countless hours, I believe, were put into developing it into the, the form that um, you have seen so far. Uh, for those of you that have come out to speak about housing and homelessness, 
Uh, I think it's been made clear at every meeting we've had, it continues to be top of mind for all of us, including county administration. And we're gonna continue to work on that. Uh, and I think we can do more to continue to try to push out the information um, about what is being done. Uh, I know that until the issue is solved, people are gonna be feeling it. Uh, and as Commissioner Labar will always remind us, the county government alone is not gonna be able to solve that uh, issue. Um, I would say that this is, it's a tough issue for many people. It's uh, deeply personal. Uh, and I've had a lot of conversations with commissioners about this. When it comes up for the vote later, I will be voting with commissioners Somerville and Robbie uh, on the resolution. We will see how it goes when we have the conversation. Typically we don't debate policy items during response to public comment, but because there are so many uh, of you here for that, um, I think that's why people felt inclined to respond immediately. Uh, at this point, I would say, I think it'd be appropriate if no one objects that we take a brief recess. Uh, you know, I think commissioners need to use the bathroom too, uh, and all of you could as well. So I would say, let's come back at 9.45. I'm not seeing an objection, so adjourn to 9.45 and we
you know, the pollen's back to order, but it's always low. It's like 10 minutes later than every time I say, I'm going to say come back at 945 and come back at 950. Every time, it's like 10 minutes. So like, this sounds like a Justin problem, well, because everybody does show up when I start banging the gavel. All right, well, we are back in action, and we are on liaison reports. Does anybody have a liaison report for me? Uh, the lights are getting dim. I don't know if we want to. It's not sleepy time yet. Let's. All right. Commissioner LeBar, what you got for us? Chair, just quickly, uh, the youth, the um, youth services center that we have funded in the past uh, in the context of mental health, um, they will be holding a session coming up. Uh, we'll get the details out to everybody on the board to get a sense of the community in terms of needs that, uh, that are out there. Uh, and so more details uh, to come on that. Uh, but again, that's the uh, Youth Assessment Center. Uh, and, and so more details in the next, hopefully, week or 10 days. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, I just got a liaison report for us. Uh, Commissioner Light, you got one. What you got? Um, I just wanted to, it's more of an announcement that um, the um, Dexter Bicentennial kickoff is this Saturday, the 20th, at Monument Park. So um, for those that are in Dexter or in District 2, surrounded by Dexter, uh, you should go. It's going to be really nice. Uh, I plan to be there. Hopefully it won't be too freezing cold, but I plan to be there. All right. Anybody else? Please, uh, Commissioner Sanders. Uh, Commissioner Light and I attended the Michigan uh, Work Southeast um, uh, meeting today at their new location on Ellsworth. Um, beautiful, absolutely beautiful building uh, that they are um, sharing with Washtenaw Community College. So I think that it, even though there was some controversy about them, um, moving to that location, it was the only location that was um, available to meet the needs, um, sort of their statutory requirements. <clears throat> um, and then also I uh, attended the Washtenaw County Road Commission meeting, uh, which was brief, nice and brief, um, but also just wanted to share because I got a, a comment from one of my constituents about um, their displeasure with the the state of the roads and the closing of the schools as a result, in their opinion, of the roads. So the response that I got back, um, or one of the responses I got back, was that we had a number of new employees working for the Road Commission, and they were um, sort of still in training out on the roads. So um, I always, I, I'm always pretty pleased with them, um, but it was a major storm, so just wanted to share that. I always appreciate the thorough road commission updates. Anybody else liaise our report? Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Chair. I would like to liaise about the Parks and Rec uh, Committee. And um, commissioners, uh, you, I think probably right after Christmas, got uh, an email from Koi Vaughn, our Director of Parks, about the um, Parks Comprehensive Strategic Plan that they're doing to um, think about the organization over the next five years and beyond. Um, they have uh, a lead consultant on that project, Jane Miller. Um, she was the former parks director, director for the city of Ann Arbor, um, internationally recognized. And we talked about this at the parks and the December meeting um, and the stakeholder groups that they were going to talk to. There was one stakeholder group that I thought was missing and that was us. Um, and so they have now reached out to you to see if you want to meet with them and talk to them about what they're thinking about the parks. I encourage you to respond to Koi's email and be able to talk to Jane about the history of park or the, the future of parks in this county um, as we go forward. Um, they will be coming here in 20 this later this year to talk about the document. So um, get with Koi soon and have your voice be heard by parks because uh, me and Yusuf were advocating for you over there. So. Talk to him. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Machieski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Board of Public Works met this morning. They have now received the letter from the state initiating the materials management plan process. Yeah. Uh, Chair, you should be receiving an email soon from Theo Eggerman uh, about this. Uh, I would anticipate, according to the discussion today, that the appointments to the Materials Management Plan Committee 
um, would be coming to us for approval sometime in the spring. Uh, and also of note today, uh, WARMA, which is a, a regional materials management group in the central part of the, in the eastern part of the county, um, they have an RFP that's been released uh, for uh, trash collection and recycling collection in Saline, Ipsy, Ipsy Township, and Pittsfield Township collectively. And that is in process as well. Um, potentially serving, uh, I believe, 31,000 households in Washtenaw County uh, once that process is complete. So it's a, a long time in the making development um, and hopefully coming to fruition later this year. I also want to note that um, I've had a couple of events in my district uh, in the past couple of weeks. The Western Washtenaw Regional Advisory Group, I want to thank Administrator Dill and uh, many members from uh, the county administration uh, for coming to the regional advisory group at their meeting in Chelsea uh, to give an update about many of the things that we're working on, many things that are going on in administration. It was greatly appreciated and well-received, so much so that I think they're going to invite you back annually. Uh, so you can look forward to that in January every year, I think, uh, Mr. Dill. Um, and uh, was it last night, Andrew? I'm losing track of time here. Uh, the Chelsea... Uh, Human Relations Commission uh, had a, an event uh, focused on housing, housing affordability, housing issues. Uh, and uh, Andrew DeLue uh, represented the county uh, on the panel, along with a representative from Avalon Housing, uh, Congresswoman Dinkle's office, uh, and the Chelsea City Council. And uh, Mr. Dill, I report that Andrew did an outstanding job uh, representing um, the county's work on housing, including some of the things that we've considered here at the board table. So I very much appreciate um, the administration and their support on both of those events. Thank you. Very nice. Commissioner Beeman, was that a hand? Were you trying to nope. Then it's Commissioner Robbie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just three other updates on parks. Uh, and thank you to Commissioner Scott for your update. Uh, I was brushing up on our agendas just to remind myself of the things that we had done. Uh, but just so that everybody knows, at the Mary Lou Murray Rec Center, I think Commissioner Scott may have mentioned this last time, but uh, they are going to be redoing the glass wall. So just be aware of that. Uh, near the pool, there's a big pool, and then there's like a glass brick wall. They're going to be taking all that down and replacing it with, uh, with clear glass and new structural improvements uh, there. In addition, uh, this might impact multiple districts. I don't know exactly where the lines are, but Border to Border Trail, there's a new segment that's being done in collaboration with the city of Ann Arbor through uh, Barton um, Park. Uh, so they're gonna be converting uh, basically a wood chip slash dirt trail into a paved trail. Uh, and ultimately there's going to be a connection uh, through Bandmere um, as well. That's going to uh, be shared. Costs are gonna be shared between the city the county and um, the uh, organization, I'm blanking on the name now, that is a nonprofit that helps support the trails, um, the border to border trail system. So, uh, so that's coming. And then the last comment I wanted to make is there was extensive discussion, uh, which we did mention a few meetings ago about uh, redoing the uh, membership structure, the fee structure for Mary Lou Murray Rec Center um, with some fee increases. And one of the things that uh, I know I advocated for uh, and, and Commissioner Scott and others advocated for is that as we increase fees, we wanna make sure that uh, residents uh, you know, can afford the increased fees. And so we have seated officially um, a, a, three, uh, a three person subcommittee uh, of the Parks Commission to explore a new uh, approach to a fee structure, whether that's sort of creating a subsidized fee structure, a scholarship system to make sure that um, all residents can afford to use the Mary Lou Murray Rec Center. So their findings will be, um, I believe they have uh, six months to come up with a uh, recommendation to the Parks Commission. So we'll await the results of that. So thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Good, uh, good update there. Anybody else for a liaison report? Nope. Uh, go ahead. Uh, sure someone will do it. None of the commissions that I serve on have met yet this year, so I will have one next time. <laughs> okay. Well, a, a non-liaison report 
we'll take it. Uh, great. Okay, so I'll give a couple. I had a meeting with the Food Policy Council. Um, they are working to get on our agenda to be able to discuss their uh, annual report. And I intend to have some more conversations with their executive committee uh, around policy goals that they have uh, that we would be able to enact at the county level. So more to come on that. Uh, and then I come with a gift for this liaison report. So got this book here. Jimena knows what I'm talking about in the audience. So he gonna give us this uh, Michigan's Guide to Public Health for Local Governing Entities, Public Health Information and Resources for County Commissioners, Boards of Health, and City Councils. I got a stack of them here uh, for the commissioners. Everybody gets one. Um, I, I'll share one with you, Greg. I'll share mine with you, Greg, um, unless there's some more at the health department that we can get. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass these around. Uh, I was waiting to have everybody in person to make sure you got it. So we'll give them this way. And uh, Greg looks a little jealous that he doesn't get one of these. You know, it's... Uh, Wait, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's good. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. This is good stuff here. Uh, I have very much enjoyed being on the board of health. I've been on the board of health since before I became a commissioner. So it's yeah, look at that. There's good pictures in there. Commissioner Somerville is very excited about this. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to say anything about the literature that we've just shared. Administrator Dill will be getting his own copy. Uh, and uh, you want a copy? No, yeah. Michelle doesn't need a copy. Uh, so yeah, please take a look at this. Uh, I expect that we will have many more conversations about public health in the very near future, uh, particularly in, as a follow-up to some of our discussions related to ARPA dollars that we allocated coming to an end and uh, a substantial amount of that went to the health department. So we should all be well-versed in public health issues. I see it, Commissioner Scott, go ahead, I'm done. Commissioner Hodge, do you think we could send, I shouldn't even say this. Do you think we could send one of these books to Ottawa County? Oh, oh. I, I don't see Bryce. I mean, I I'd be supportive of that. You know, we could send one to, to them. I like it. Yeah, we haven't gone on the right. We haven't gone on the offensive yet with uh, our sending of communication. We probably a PDF. I'm sure exists of this. Right. We could send them the PDF as a communication. I like it. Well, let's come up with the language for that. Okay. That thus thus ends my liaison report. All right, we're going to move on into special orders of business. We have none. Uh, appointments, we have a couple of appointments. Somebody like to move the appointments for me. Is there, okay, any discussion of the appointments? Nope, anybody want to pull any for separate consideration? I sure hope not. Nope, okay, well then let's go ahead and vote on our appointments. This is, it's roll call because you only do it one time. I'm just testing you, Bryce. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Hodge. Yes. Commissioner Labar. Yes. Commissioner Light. Yes. Commissioner Machieski. Yes. Commissioner Robbie. Yes. Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Scott. Yes. Commissioner Somerville. Yes. Commissioner Beeman. Yes. Sure. Appointments passed. Congratulations to those appointed. Thank you for your service to Washtenaw County. All right, moving to the consent agenda. Uh, just say before I ask for a, a motion on that, nothing spicy. We didn't get any interesting communications, uh, but we might start something here if we're going to send one of these to Ottawa County. We only had one communication, uh, and I believe it was from the city of Ann Arbor. So. Uh, would somebody like to move the consent agenda? Second. Okay. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Can't imagine anybody want to pull any of these for separate consideration. Nope. No discussion on it either. All right. This one's a voice vote. All in favor of passage of the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Here and none. Consent agenda passed. All right. Moving on into resolutions. Somebody like to move the first reading resolutions and just the first reading ones, please. Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Chair. I would like to move uh, 9 1 A, a resolution ratifying the application to the State of Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, Energy and Community Management Grant, grant Program from Facilities Management. B, a resolution to authorize a sub recipient agreement with the City of Ann Arbor under the Community Geothermal Heating and Cooling Design and Deployment Funding from Facilities Management. A res C, a resolution authorizing the facilities management department to serve as a host partner site for a Michigan Healthy Climate Corps member from facilities management. Facilities, you're busy. D, a resolution authorizing the approval of the mid-year budget adjustment for the Washtenaw County Health Department and position creations from the health department. E, a resolution to approve the cyber security grant program local consent agreement from information technology. F, a resolution ratifying the application and acceptance of the Community Violence Intervention Initiative Grant from the Sheriff's Office. 
uh, the community violence intervention grant funded by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for the period of January 1, 24 to September 30, 25. G, a resolution approving the electronic submission of the grant application and agreement for the strategic traffic enforcement program authorizing the county administrator to sign the notice of grant award, amending the budget and authorizing the administrator to sign delegate contracts from the sheriff's office. H, a resolution approving the tentative agreement with TPOAM supervisors and probation agents for its 2024-02, oh, 2024-2-2027 uh, collective bargaining agreement. That is all of the first reading. Thank you. Thank you both. I always count on you to move the agenda. Uh, any, would, it, would anybody like to pull any of these for separate consideration? No, nope. any discussion on them? Commissioner Robbie, I know you were issued for this one. Well, you know, I'm, I'm always itching to talk on every- You always got the itch. Yes, I do. Okay, so I just have uh, two questions on the first reading uh, uh, motions that were just made. The first is on item A. Um, I, so I did send my questions in advance this time. Uh, so hopefully uh, the answers will be not that complicated, but I just wanted to clarify on the geothermal, um, the, am I looking at the right one here? Is that the first one, geothermal system? No, that's item B, um, geothermal system. So I was just wanted to make sure, uh, is this grant money for, actual construction or is it just for the design process? That's the first question I have. Jason, ready to go. Yeah. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for uh, considering these three items tonight. I'd also like to introduce and recognize Mary Braun uh, from my team, who's really gets yeah, the yeah. credit for the bulk of this work. Um, but uh, to answer your question, commissioner, uh, this is just a planning grant, um, just to do the development and planning of it. There is no construction at this point, um, depending on how the process goes for the planning. Um, next step would be to move into uh, construction, but that would be a different package and we would bring that back uh, to this body at that time. Uh, do you know how, like what the vision is for what this will look like from a governance perspective? Like the, con will it, I assume it'll all, the geothermal system will be owned by the city of Ann Arbor. Correct. That's the plan. And then is there like similar to like a water utility where you pay for, you know, a, a service unit? Is that similarly envisioned for this or are we just going to be part of this for free or how does that work? Um, all we have, all those details have not been figured out yet at this point. It's a, the, the goal is a district. Mary's standing up too, so. Mary's? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, the goal is is for district geothermal, so um, it would be we're we're assuming the city would own it and operate it. We would be part of it. Um, it would encompass our Ellsworth property along with city adjacent city property uh, and some homes in the Bryant uh, Bryant community uh, center and some homes in the Bryant uh, neighborhood. Okay, I heard the word assuming. If you if I'm gonna vote yes, that's fine. But I just if you could get me a, a stronger answer on who is going to own it and what the payment system will be, if any, like whether we pay a subscription fee or a fee per service unit, BTU, I don't know. Mary's standing next to you now. Sorry, if I can. <laughs> so I did um, have a chance to speak with the um, the group that's kind of running the, the grant today. Um, and that is all gonna be part of this process okay. like determining who will actually be own the system um what the maintenance structure will be and all of that so the, the county will have a say in those decisions okay in the process i guess as we as we have a say in those decisions i would encourage that we adamantly advocate for public ownership of some kind whether that's the city of ann arbor or the you know, another public entity, uh, but that's number one. And uh, just making sure that's really my only most important thing is that it is publicly owned and that we're not building an asset for DTE, for example, to ultimately own and operate. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for submitting your questions in advance.
I think that really makes it easier for them. That's good. Yeah. I, I do have one more uh, on a different. No, 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 no. Anybody else got any on this one? A. You B. Sorry, B. C D E F G. Uh, go. Got something else above? You know. On another. On right, another. Anybody got any? No, there's no more on this one. Uh, go ahead. What you got? Uh, okay, so the next question is probably for Sheriff's Office representative. I don't know if we. All right, Director Jackson, you're up. Jackson's up. Is he here or is he a voice in the cloud? He is a voice in the cloud and he will be a face on the screen. So please hold for Director Jackson. I'm here if you can hear me. We can hear you. Hello. Uh, well, he hello, welcome. Um, I can hear you. I can't see you. That's kind of weird, but it's okay. Um, so my question is, so this, this grant uh, for the Office of Highway Safety Planning um, this is a, a one-year grant, um, and I'm just wondering what that looks like in terms of long-term funding. They're, we're creating positions through this, is my understanding. Is that right? Uh, are you talking about the strategic enforcement or the secondary role patrol? Because uh, I think they're both on the agenda. You're right. I, I'm, I, you are correct. I meant to ask you about a different one here. So okay. I have questions at this time i will have questions during single reading um, okay please hold director jackson because we will call on you later all right anybody else got any other questions for the first reading items hearing none bryce it's a voice vote all in favor of passing first reading items aye. aye any opposed all right first reading items passed would somebody like to we have no final reading items today so would somebody like to move the single reading items and approval of claims while you're at it? Yeah, you know, you got to read them. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Mort, can we, can we do it? Let's try to hold with Commandy. I figured it might be late enough. I could get away with it. Um, chair for single reading. Um, Start with a resolution uh, authorizing the uh, or ratifying the county's uh, admin's signature on the uh, clean sweep grant. B a resolution ratifying the chair of the board on the grant application for City of Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. C a resolution to authorize grants fund grant fund application for completion of structures at Gordon Hall. D, a resolution approving the urban county bylaws. E, the resolution creating the four full-time equivalent positions at Hawk. F, a resolution appreciation to Brenda Kerr for her 20 years of service from information technologies. Uh, and then G, uh, the resolution denouncing rising hate and discrimination in Washington County and calling for a lasting bilateral ceasefire in Gaza and Israel. And approval of claims. Let me not forget approval of claims. Yes. There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody want to pull any for separate consideration? I expect G. G will be pulled. Uh, other. Other. You got another one? Anybody got any other? Uh, Commissioner Robbie? Instead of turning it on. I would like to pull item D. Okay. Exciting bylaws. Uh, any other? So far, we've got D and G. Give them a moment to look at it. Also, take this opportunity to remind you of that board portal. Super convenient. Scroll right through it. You can tap on it. Get your login board portal. Uh, you shouldn't be logged out, Commissioner Somerville. Well, okay. Are we done? Or is that it? That's it. Okay. Uh, okay, any questions or discussion of the, the all the other ones, not the two we pulled? Yeah, I know you got the one for Director Jackson. Get it. All right, bring them back. Um, Chair, we also have Lieutenant Kratzenberg. Oh, okay. Well, Kratzenberg. Lieutenant's here too. Great. He will be off mute as well. Fire away, Commissioner Robbie. I, I actually have to ask for your permission on something, Chair. Uh oh. I. Uh, there's too many sheriff's office items on the agenda. And so the two questions that I had were actually relating to issues that were on uh, that were on first reading, but since we have an opportunity 
at the next meeting to have uh, more questions answered. Do you mind if I uh, at least have an opportunity to ask the questions? And we've already voted for it, but. You want to ask the questions now? Or you want to ask if, them next If that's time? okay, and they can answer them yeah, why next not? time if they want. Why but, not? Um, but yeah, it's unrelated to the Office of Highway Safety Planning issue that's on single reading. Um, so the, the question that I had, uh, Director Jackson was was on the community violence intervention grant, which was yeah, which was on, mm -hmm. for, um, and the, and so I was that was where my question was the money's one time, but the positions are being created on a permanent basis, and so my basic question is trying to understand what the long term funding positions are, are funding options are for those positions essentially. That's what I was wondering. Yes, got it. Um, so these positions, the just so folks know, we're talking about the outreach workers that are doing violence intervention work as a part of our we live program um yeah. were originally put in as millage positions uh this grant came up and so they have always been intended at some point to be created and millage funded uh the state rfp uh allowed us to kind of jump start that um and expand that program so the grant's going to pay for it now and then the ongoing um revenue that would pay for those positions would be out of the millage. Okay, uh, thank you. And then I am hopefully gonna be receiving a chart soon of the um, numbers and what grades and groups mean, but could you just give me a union, non-union breakdown on the positions? The looks like three that are being created. Um, so for the CVI grant, there are the two interventionists, um, one this year and the grant pays for one next year. Uh, they're both non-union positions. Okay. I, oh, yeah. Two two FTEs. One is yeah, community outreach specialist. The two. Okay, I see it now. Yeah, it, it, it's just broken down, commissioner. Um, the grant breaks it down by year, so we're able to hire one uh, out of the grant in the first year, and then um, although it's a abbreviated year in October, uh, after October first, we can hire the second one. Okay. So both non-union. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What What's the reasoning behind that? Um, I, you, that's a good question. I think it's really just based on uh, the role that they'll be playing, where they are within the sheriff non-union kind of breakdown. All of our interventionists and outreach workers are within uh, sheriff non-union. And so they are in alignment with what is kind of already set up in our uh, sheriff's office structure. Okay. Um, I would like to explore this with you further between now and the next meeting um, to better understand that. I, I feel like... Uh, the I'd like to hear a further justification for why they would not be in uh, a, at least a, a TPOAM type unit. Okay, absolutely. And and then my other question was about secondary road patrol, and it was, but it was relating to the county parks and rec commission. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that's you're you're saying that part of the funding difference for the secondary road patrol grant. Uh, in terms of what they're, the state's giving us versus what the cost is, is going to be basically through a sheriff's uh, contract with Parks and Rec. But I guess, can you help walk me through, like, what does Parks and Rec get for that and help me understand why SRP is being funded with that money? Yeah, so um, over the years, the SRP grant has slowly but surely decreased. Uh, and so several years ago, right now it funds... Uh, one and three quarters of a deputy, basically. And one of the ways that we filled that last quarter of a gap was several years ago when uh, County Parks and Rec came to us and they, um, in essence, wanted kind of our eyes and ears uh, to help keep parks safe for people who were visiting. And so we created what are called Park Service Officer Positions or PSOs. The easiest way I describe them is almost like park rangers. Um, they're um, summer jobs, they are mostly filled by college kids. It is a great recruiting tool for us. Um, uh, and they have limited enforcement abilities. They really are the eyes and the ears out there um, at our county parks and in some of our waterways. Um, and so that's the contract with us between parks. It just happens to be um, that that contract allows us to fill that last little quarter gap. And so those two deputies are fully paid for by um, this grant. And then the other small portion is paid for thanks to that um, uh, contract with Parks and Rec. Okay, and then follow-up question just to clarify. So you're saying that 
the 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 money isn't necessarily um, the money is going to offset the SRP grant for the two deputies, and and parks are getting a service in return, but it's not necessarily the SRP deputies that are patrolling parks. It's a supervisor of those young people, and and Lieutenant Krasenberg is also on here because he actually helps oversee it. So you can probably talk a little bit more details, Lieutenant. Uh, but it is a supervisory role. Uh, that also helps us to do that. Uh, someone is really supervising an individual, is supervising those young people. Yes, that, that deputy um, during the park season is pulled from secondary road patrol and they go into the park's position where they are the manager or supervisor um, of the PSOs. And they're also patrolling the parks as well with them. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't know if you ended the sentence or if you cut out there, but um, that, that all makes sense. Thank you. And just to clarify, these are seasonal positions for the park service officers. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. The last thing I'll just say, this isn't a question, but, uh, you know, again, expressing concern about the county's reliance on seasonal workers. Um, I think that I would like for us to think of ways to start making some of these positions year round as somebody who was a seasonal worker for the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, it can be and was uh, an abusive situation where, you know, people are terminated for two months, have to go on unemployment, uh, don't get benefits. And uh, I just hope that we can try to find ways to treat our employees better um, than that. And this is not the specific complaint or gripe about the sheriff's office, but it applies to all of county, county government and county parks. Um, so uh, thank you both gentlemen for answering my questions. Thank you, Chair, for indulging me on in going out of order. Uh, I don't have any other comments on sheriff's office related issues at this time. Thank you. I always happy to indulge. Uh, anybody else have questions about sheriff's office related things? Seeing none. Well, thank you, team online, and congratulations to the sheriff's office. Uh, and if I remember correctly, our health department on the application uh, to receive the grant related to community violence interruption work. Uh, for the board, that's something that we've continued to invest in significantly, and we're we're seeing good positive movement uh, that our work that we're that work is successful. Uh, we're going to hear more about it as we go on, um, but great to have the public health officer in there trying to there you go all right i see you um so thank you to the health department and to the sheriff's office for that looking forward to seeing uh what comes from this grant any other questions about the ones that were not pulled friends seeing none I'm seeing none bryce no time commissioner lavar yes commissioner light Yes. Commissioner Macieski. Yes. Commissioner Robbie. Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Scott. Yes. Commissioner Somerville. Yes. Commissioner Beeman. Yes. Commissioner Hodge. Yes. All right. Most resolutions pass. We're going to move on to item D. I know what this one's about. Commissioner Robbie. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'm sorry to, for those that are getting tired of the sound of my voice, but I, I maybe shouldn't have even pulled this one. I maybe should have just voted no and moved on in life, but uh, this is an ongoing uh, issue that I have uh, with county boards and committees, uh, and my primary concern with these uh, bylaws changes is that it is um, removing the requirement that the meetings be in person. And I believe that that is a violation of the spirit of the Open Meetings Act and perhaps the letter of the Open Meetings Act. Um, I believe that all public meetings should be held in person. Uh, not everybody has access to virtual devices. Uh, not everybody has access to a phone uh, to call into these meetings. And, uh, and so I think it's great that we offer a virtual option for people, uh, but I think that public meetings should always be in person so that members of the public can come and confront their public officials in person uh, and have the conversations that they need, say their piece during public comment. And again, if people have you know, transportation issues or whatever the case may be, they should be able to call in virtually. There should be always a virtual option, but 
public officials should be required to be in person, especially when there's voting. Uh, and in all of our boards and committees, be they advisory or non-advisory, there is voting that occurs to uh, make recommendations to the Board of Commissioners on actions that we are to take. And so our appointees, our public officials, and at the end of the day, I believe that they should be in person and accountable to the public at those in-person meetings. And so I have consistently and will consistently vote against all changes to bylaws that involve a removal of the requirement that our boards and committees meet in person. And I will particularly say, having been the chair of the urban county for five years, these are very important discussions and decisions that happen there. You're the chair of that body right now. And uh, a lot, you know, millions of dollars of federal money uh, go through the urban county, uh, then those dollars directly impact housing and homelessness issues in our community. And so members of the public, again, uh, who are more likely to not have access to a tablet, a computer, a phone, uh, to be able to participate in those meetings should be able to attend in person um, at the LRC in uh, on Washtenaw. So that's my piece. I'm going to be a no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. And to clarify in this particular case, Urban County has been meeting virtually as long as I've been on it. Uh, these changes are in line with us now actually moving back in person uh, and maintaining the option for the people that can't attend in person to be able to be virtual. So Urban County will be coming back in person. I don't know if any of our friends from OCD want to say anything about it. Yes, there you go. That was, a, that was your cue to... Uh, yeah, we're moving back to, this won't satisfy you completely, Commissioner Robbie, but we are moving back to uh, more of a hybrid um, format where we're going to have three or four of our seven meetings in person, and the others would be um, remote, um, and there would still be a remote option for the ones that are in person for the members of the body. Um, that being said, the ones that are in person are purposefully scheduled for times we're having a public hearing or where we're really talking about funding decisions. So they were thoughtfully planned out for the schedule for 2024 when, when we had that conversation at Urban County and folks voted for that. Go ahead. 